for doom.
is usually safe. It should bring an immediate return. Shoot the radar into the ground and the bone bounces the image back. Bounces it back. This new program's incredible. Mm. Two more years development and we won't even have to dig anymore. Where's the fun in that? It's a little distorted, but I don't think it's a computer. Oh. mortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments. Velociraptor? Yeah, it's good shape, too. It's five, six feet high, I'm guessing nine feet long. Look at the extraordinary... What'd you do? He touched it. <laughs> Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. Oh, he got it in for me. <laughs> and look at the half-moon-shaped bones on the wrist. It's no one of these guys learn how to fly. That doesn't look very scary. <laughs> More like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> Turkey. Turkey. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. Look at the pubic bone, turned backward, just like a bird. Look at the vertebrae, full of air sacs and hollows, more just like, like a bird. More like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> Turkey. Six foot turkey. Turkey. Six foot turkey. Okay. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. You get your first look at this six-foot turkey as you enter a clearing. Oh, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. How's everyone doing? It's wonderful to have you here. So glad you could join me for another fun stream today, and it is going to be a fun one. I guarantee it. If anybody's here for the very first time, whether you're watching this live like you, uh, Neely Co, Neely Coey, Neely Co, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome. Whether you're watching live right now, like uh, all of you wonderful chat members, whether you're watching later on in the VOD or even on YouTube, because all these are going up on YouTube nowadays as well. Really? So glad you're here. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thank you, Sheridanicus, for that gift sub there. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you kindly. Let me introduce myself if anybody's new. Uh, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know this already, but I'll say it just for the sake of anybody who might be kind of new to this idea. A paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologist. And I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach, you know? Talking about fossils, answering people's questions about my own research and that of my colleagues. Trying to 
give you an inside peek into the world of fossil science. Show you how all this stuff works. You know, how do we dig up fossils? And uh, find out new things about the ancient past. I'll walk you through it, you know? Everybody's got questions about dinosaurs. Or natural history, extinction, evolution, all that good stuff. Everybody's curious about this just naturally. If you don't have questions about those topics, it's probably because you're, I don't know, asleep or, well, I don't know. You might have worse things going on in your life or you wouldn't be super curious about that. But if you're here watching, I bet you got questions and I've got answers for you. I'll do my very best to kind of walk you through this stuff and, uh, yeah, you know how it goes. Anyway, uh, before we get started with today's fossil news, where we're going to be discussing the American pronghorn and the American cheetah that has been hypothesized to prey upon the American pronghorn. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about a potential upper body limit, like upper body size limit for uh, meat eating dinosaurs. New paper just came out. And uh, we might talk about that new pterosaur finally, too. I know I keep teasing that. But yeah, and we'll have plenty of QA. We'll have some dinosaur deep dives along the way. It's going to be a good time. So I'm really glad you're here. But before we get to any of that, let me scroll up to the top of chat. Say hello to everybody. Smorphosaurus may have been first today. At least according to my readout on chat. How are you doing, Smorph? Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. The Lenina. Thank you for everything you do, Lenina. It's great to see you. By the way, Lenina was streaming Saurian over the weekend. I got to tune in briefly. Uh, yeah, that was fun, Lenina. That was fun. I'm glad you got to, uh, to play that wonderful dinosaur simulator game. It's good stuff. Layer T, what's shaking with you? Good to see ya. Uh, Ghostly Ghoul. Uh, yeah. We're all about learning stuff here, Ghostly Ghoul. And I'm glad you're here. Welcome back. Uh, Dinosaur Dave. Howdy, howdy, Dinosaur Dave. I hope all is well. Uh, Ali J, how are you doing? Great to see you. Always put a smile on my face. Welcome back. Uh, Portugask. Howdy, howdy. What's shaking, Portugask? Uh, Origin TT. Hey to you too. Hope you're doing well. And what is this, Dinosaur Dave? Uh, dinosaurs through history. Oh, that's interesting. You know what? Let's play this real quick while I'm doing the... Uh... Yeah, dinosaurs through history animation. Let's take a look. I'll try not to get too distracted. Well, no, this is going to be... Shoot, this is going to be too distracting. I need to get through chat first. Then we can take a look at this. But it looks cool, Dinosaur Dave. Uh, Jordy Fish, good afternoon to you too. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Arlay, uh, how are you doing? Welcome back, it's good to see ya. Roland Elliart, how are you doing, Roland? And Travel the World, how are you doing, Travel? It's great to see ya. Thank you for your stalwart support, Travel. I appreciate you. It's good to have you here. Hope your day's going well. Gargoware, how are you doing, Gargoware? Welcome, welcome. Uh, and Dr. Terrace's The Dodo is going to be back. Read alert, read alert. What do you mean, Dr. Tara? If you have more info, I'm... Can color me intrigued. Bubsy646 found a neat video on wing-assisted incline running. We might take a look at that as well. Um, <laughs> oh, this is going to be great. This is right up my alley, Bubsy. Thank you, thank you. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, there's a pigeon on an escalator. That's my kind of video. Uh, Birds of Dead On, how are you doing, Birds? Welcome, welcome. Uh, Shara Danicus, now live from beautiful SoCal. It's the one and only Danny Anduza. That must be a different Danny Anduza, Shara Danicus. Because I live in Northern California. I'm broadcasting to you from the beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah um it's great to have you here sheridanicus welcome welcome california geography isn't everybody's strong suit you know uh yeah yeah um fall machine how are you doing start stretching turkey boy time is coming to run soon there you go fall machine yes indeed i don't think he made it luna seer this is a high bye. Have a great stream, Danny and all. Thank you, Lunasir. You can't stick around? Well, I will see you soon, Lunasir. Thank you for being here, albeit briefly. Thank you for your continued support. It means a lot to me. 
Uh, TMKDK, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And Astronomy Show? Ackerman from Kung Fu. I don't know what that is, Astronomy Show. Yeah. Birds are dead on. A six foot parrot would be something to behold and be scared of, probably. Uh. Yeah, and Neeliko, how are you doing? Hello to you too. Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Travel says haircut looks good. Thank you, Travel. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'm starting to settle into it. Yeah. Paper Cuts, how are you doing? Welcome back. Good to see you. Yeah, a truck horn. Hello, everyone, to you as well. A truck horn. Thanks for joining us. Invisible Dimensions says hi. Right back at you. Invisible Dimensions. Glad to see you. And Scalawag. Howdy, howdy. How are things in your part of the world? I hope they're good, Scalawag. I'm glad you're here. Aditi Yelkar says, hi, everyone. How are you doing, Aditi? Welcome. Welcome. Joe3E, I'm doing quite well. Better now that you're here, Joe3E. Thank you for joining us. It's good to see you. Darth Goof says, I've watched that video. Oh, cool, Darth Goof. Is it good? Would you recommend it? And, uh... Yeah. And Smorphosaurus, I understand. Good luck with your, uh... You're a veterinarian visit there, Smorphosaurus. I know that could be stressful for dogs and for people, so, um... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yay for too distracting. I know it's gonna be good. Yeah, Layer T, we'll take a look at it. Should be good. And, yeah, the largest carnivore... No, largest terrestrial carnivore is the polar bear today. A DTL car. The largest carnivore overall... I guess it depends on whether you consider baleen whales to be carnivores or not. Otherwise, it would be a sperm whale. Um, but yeah. And top of the top of the dinosaur to you, says Mayor Space. I don't know what accent that was. But uh, to you as well, Mayor Space. Good to have you here. Yeah. And Mommy does says, we don't talk about SoCal. No, no, no. Yeah, I don't know. And no, you're good, Sheridanicus. <laughs> Sheridanicus, that's why, that's why I made this. Uh, I'm not getting paid by any tourism boards or anything. It's just, you know. Yeah. Isn't this cool? Motion postcard. Yeah. Uh, anywho. Who else have we got here? Tommy Plodicus. Howdy, howdy. Welcome back, Tommy Plod. Good to have you here. Mudman1965. Hello to you as well. Oliver says, hey, every guys. Hey, every Oliver. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And parrots are world-class trolls. I agree, Mayor Space. And they all bite. I mean... That's how they eat their food. Of course they bite. None of them drink through straws, as far as I know. I would not want to be around a human-sized parrot. You never know what it might decide to do to you. Yeah, Mayor Space. Man, it could... It could crack your skull open like, uh... Like a... Corn nut. Or something. Some sort of easy to bite through, hard shelled, like a, uh, like one of those Whopper candies, just, just like that, you know? Yeah. Anyway, and uh, Hacker Man is okay. Astronomy show, interesting. Yeah. Uh, Nivy, hello, hello, welcome, welcome, and uh. And Sheridanicus, yes, the upper body limit size for bipedal dinosaurs seems to be a lot lower than for quadrupedal dinosaurs. When you've got four legs, it's a lot easier to support more weight. So we'll be talking about that, too. Yeah. And Lenina says, I love blue whales. I do, too, Lenina. But I'm so excited for the day that we find an ichthyosaur that is larger. Me, too, Lenina. I, I would not be shocked if that happened pretty soon. Yeah... And Colossal is bringing back the dodo bird. I know they're, s they're saying that, Dr. Terra, but I... Do, do you have a link? Because that's going to be tougher than... than we would expect, I think. But yeah, yeah. Like a sunflower seed. There you go, Dinosaur Dave. Yeah, it's a good analogy. Parrot biting through stuff. Uh, is it true that Danny is San Fran's most popular attraction? No, that would probably be Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> um, 
I used to work in San Francisco, and yeah, there would be about, what was it, 15 people who would come to watch me every day? Or rather, I would watch them. I was, I was a teacher, you know. But, uh, yeah, so far from it. <laughs> uh, that's where the soft center is, says Oliver. There you go. Yeah. And, uh... And you rode in on an Andric Ethereum just to watch the show? Very nice, paramedics. I hope you enjoy. Andric Ethereum, one of the largest land mammals that's ever lived. It is the largest. If you consider Paraceratherium and and uh, Baluk Ethereum to be the same critter. What is the deal with those nowadays? Let's look those up real quick. These big, uh, big mammal boys. Indric Ethereum. Yeah. This is actually a gigantic rhinoceros. I kid you not. Yeah. Uh, significantly larger than an African elephant today. These guys are like approaching sauropod size. It's pretty impressive. Um, yeah. Anyway, but what do we call them nowadays? Paracer Ethereum? Yeah. An extinct genus of hornless rhinoceros. Uh, Baluch Ethereum redirects here. But what about Indric Ethereum? Hmm. Genus synonymy. Indric Ethereum. Okay. So I guess they're all Paracer Ethereum, which were, was named back in 1908. Predating Indric Ethereum by eight years and Baluch Ethereum by five years, it looks like. Paraceratherium. There you go. Uh, one of the largest terrestrial mammals that has existed. It's a cool critter. It's big. It's Paraceratherium. Yeah. Uh, and they are... Astronomy Show says reminds me of a tapir. Astronomy Show is onto something there. Let me show you why. It's because both rhinoceros and tapirs... And they're perfectly preserved. Watch that kid. No! No! <laughs> Araz, thank you for the 20 months of support. I appreciate that more than you know. Thank you, thank you, Haraz. Excellent stuff. Thanks for keeping me here on the air for that long, Haraz. I, uh, I appreciate you more than you know. Thank you, thank you. Hey, let's look up Perissodactyla. In fact, let's look up... Rhinoceros. I'm gonna zoom into mammals, ungulates, odd toed ungulates, parasodactyls. Hmm. There's our rhinoceros. Right there. Five living species of rhinoceros, all of them endangered, as far as I know. Um, except for uh, the white rhinoceros is close. Ugh. These critters are not doing well. They need our protection. But anyway, yeah. Um, rhinoceros, and then look who's right next to him. It's tapirs. Yeah. Tapirs are also parasodactyls. Odd toed ungulates. And then horses are quite nearby as well. They're also odd toed ungulates. Not odd as in strange. Odd as in an odd number. So all of these critters either have one toe, like horses do, they've got a single hoof on each uh, on each foot, or they've got three. Both one and three are odd numbers last time I checked. I'm no, you know, I'm no big city mathematician, but I usually know when a number is odd or even. And these guys are odd toed ungulates. Renoa poison? What? <laughs> and that's an, uh, an even number right there. And no poison, 222. It's also a palindrome, and uh, that's just a beautiful number. Thank you, no poison. How was your stream? I hope it was really, really good. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Holy cow. Uh, and uh, welcome, JC2023, Mulksy, Blast You. 
And uh, Jenny Fazbaum, how are you doing? Actual Deg. Uh, Joe Me Mo, how are you? Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Holy cow. And thank you, JC2023, for the follow. Um, and thank you, Sheridanicus. I appreciate that very much. Uh, the first one actually wasn't a dinosaur. That was Dimetrodon, not a dinosaur. Anyway, um, what well, the kid was singing there. Welcome to Paleontologizing, everybody. Extraordinary group of animals that have ever appeared on this planet. Thank you, Cassie and Dean and Lulu Beth for those follows. Really appreciate that. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some uh, science outreach. And thank you, thank you. Holy moly, JC2023. Really appreciate that. Holy moly, that is extraordinary. Here, we need a more upbeat song than this right here. There we go. We just started the broadcast, and uh, yeah, we're uh, we're talking about the interrelatedness of different mammals. We'll be talking about mammals a bit today. You're not doing so badly yourself for a paleontologist. Uh, you make me blush. Thank you, Go Go Gadget three hundred and sixty. Uh, Loser121 and Odious Swan. What a great name. Thank you for the follows, everybody. Welcome to Paleontologizing. By the way, uh, Renoa Poison, how was your stream? I hope it was phenomenal. Raiders, how was it? Yeah, I, I, I'm flattered that you would bring everybody here, helping me with my mission of science outreach and education. If anybody here has any questions about dinosaurs, about fossils, about the history of life on Earth, about extinction and evolution and how science works. Don't be shy with those questions, but maybe be patient with them. Because I'm going to play a quick welcome video to kind of introduce some new folks to the channel. If they're removed, America loses them forever. Welcome to the community, JC2023, and thank you very much for that subscription. Really appreciate that. It's got nothing to do with oil. I'm a paleontologist. Well, thank you, Pascal, for the follow. I'm going to introduce you to my good friend, previously recorded Danny, and he's going to walk you through a little welcome video. No expense. Thank you, Nafron, for that gift sub. Excellent. I, uh, yeah, you're in good hands with him. He'll tell you about this channel, what a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch, all that good stuff. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and bring him on. He's actually walking up behind me right now. So previously recorded, Danny. The floor is yours. Show these cool new people what this is all about. Thanks, present day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies in the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary. And Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic field work in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, 
Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada, but most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana, in the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. And uh, much like my field work, my research focuses on dinosaurs. I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology. All these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had, I want to know what they used them for. Right now, I'm working on a study on spinosaurs. All right, but don't ask me too much about that because it's uh, still a project in the works and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published. But anyway, a couple years ago, I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana. So I packed up and headed back to the West Coast. And I've become kind of fed up with all the bullshit in academia, so uh, I found myself another job. I am now a teacher in early childhood education. And let me tell you, it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see a rare and ancient thing, like Velociraptor's jump, or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids want to see them lining up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely. So back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion. And now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. It, at least I have more time for outreach. And I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And thank you, Molksy, for that follow. And Jamimo for the follow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. And thank you so much, holy cow, to Renoa Poison for that incredible raid. Really excellent. Welcome, welcome, everybody. And, and like I said, if you've got questions, now is the time. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, looks like Renoa Poison was doing some just chatting. I assume it was wonderful if this many people were watching. So, uh... So glad to have you here. Thank you again, Renault Poison. And Belint is here too. How are you doing, Science Streams? Howdy, howdy. Man, that partner badge is looking awful sharp on you. Congrats again. Uh, great to see you, Science Streams. 
And uh, Pascal says that's an amazing introduction, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Pam19822, for the follow. Yeah, and Summer Plasma, thank you for the follow. Great to have you here. I imagine that mammals would still be small creatures like this living in the nooks and crannies of their world. I would agree. We wouldn't be here. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, Cassie and Dean, great to have you here. Um, welcome back, uh, Brainington. How are you doing? Art Young Might. Howdy, howdy. Hope all is well. Looks like we had a got a question from Go Go Gadget. Why do I think of astronomy when I hear Jack Horner? Is that crazy? Yeah, and Jack Horner is a dinosaur paleontologist. I don't know if they're... There's James Horner, who's a composer. James Horner did the music for Titanic. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Pascal, thank you for uh, saying hello. Good to have you here. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, Renoa says she is a... Oh, Go Go Gadget says Renoa is a scam baiter. She does a great job of it, too. Uh, yeah, so glad to be able to share this platform with her here on Twitch. Good stuff. And, uh, Summer Plasma says, love the intro and your passion. Had to drop a follow. Thank you, Summer Plasma. I appreciate that. Yeah, and welcome everybody to my, uh, to my office here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, show you the view from outside my office. Wow, pretty beautiful, right? Holy cow. But yeah, I'm broadcasting to you from the beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. Although, uh, this is what the inside of my office looks like. Um, yeah, these are all 3D printed fossils here. So that's a juvenile Tyrannosaurus. You you heard about that in the uh, the welcome video. Life-size juvenile Tyrannosaurus. Got a bunch of other ones, too. And uh, right here on the 3D printer is the last piece of our Iguanodon hand is now printed. I will probably be assembling that later after we look through some videos and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah. Iguanodon. One of everybody's favorite dinosaurs, I'm certain. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Jomimo says, Jurassic Park is hands down my favorite film of all time. Very cool, Jomimo. It's a great movie. It's a classic. Boys love dinosaurs and those that study them. Well, you're in the right place, Jomimo. Great to have you here. Yeah. And Jack Horkheimer. Oh, interesting, Gogo Gadget. I'm not familiar with that name. Yeah. Mayor Space's little Jack Horner sat on the corner eating a Christmas pie. And it was the middle of July, you know? That's why it was so remarkable. Nobody knew how he could find a Christmas pie uh, during, you know, peak summer. But yeah. Um, I guess that's, that's why there are rhymes about them. Uh, any rain, says Putty Sour? Not lately, no. Hasn't rained in a couple weeks here. Yeah, and that is the thumb spike, Lenina, on the Iguanodon there. Yes, indeed. I will be showing that to you later. We will get that... Uh, yeah, we'll get that assembled. Very excited. Here's the, the rest of the hand. I've actually been working on assembling some more, so here's the radius and ulna right here. There's the wrist. And then there's the fingers there. You know, it's an animal with pretty big limbs. Iguanodon bernis artensis. Not a small critter when it's grown. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bad Vulture says, Any advice on field work slash seasonal work? I'm planning on taking a similar path in the wildlife biology field. Very nice, Bad Vultures. Very nice. Let's see. Advice. I immediately think of, like, gear. Um... I don't know, make sure that you're you're going to be doing field work. Yeah, just make sure you're, like, feeling fit for it. Sometimes it helps to do, like, maybe a little bit of training before you actually go out and do stuff like digging dinosaurs or any other kind of field work, I suppose. Just make sure you're comfortable with walking. Get some really good shoes. Good boots, if you're in a dry environment, are uh, a great thing to have. Make sure you break them in. Um... Yeah, sunscreen, bug spray. Yeah, make sure you never skimp on those things. Make sure you got plenty of, uh, especially sunscreen. And uh, yeah, have fun with it. That's the thing. Field work, so much, I think a big part of enjoying field work is 
being able to, not everybody can do this, but being able to just kind of sit and laugh when things go badly. Because things always go wrong in the field. That's why it's field work. You know, you're out of the laboratory. You're no longer in a controlled environment. You're out in the middle of nowhere oftentimes, and, like, you never know what's going to happen weather-wise or wild animal-wise or, you know, there, there's so many more variables out there uh, on the great outdoors. So, yeah, just being able to have a good sense of humor about things and go, you know what? This is going to make a great story. That'll, that attitude will get you through a lot, of, a lot of bad situations. So, yeah. A good hat is also a beautiful thing, Mary Space. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Oliver, I don't know if practicing by digging holes in your backyard... I mean, if you're trying to learn digging technique, that can't hurt, I suppose. Mayor Space's moist towelettes? Yes, indeed. I got some more moist towelettes from some members of chat. Those are a godsend. If you don't have access to a shower... Being able to kind of bathe at the end of the day with some, uh, some moist towelettes, you know, uh, yeah, that's, that's good stuff. It's good stuff. Then Aditya says, are you going to stream live on Twitch, the field work you do this summer? That's the plan, Aditya, yeah. Yeah, I'm testing some of the, uh, the equipment for that this week. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be good. Going to be, hopefully, having some live fieldwork streams this summer. Uh, digging up dinosaurs live on Twitch. So I not, won't just be telling you how these things work. I can actually show you live. I'm very excited about this. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity for some excellent science outreach. So yeah. Yeah. And uh, Joe Mimos says, what's your favorite dinosaur? I'm sure you've never been asked that before. Yeah, it's not like I have a special command just for that. Joe Mimo. <laughs> But I'll, I'll show you another one of my favorite dinosaurs that's not on there. Um, yeah. Shower in a can, dry shampoo. There you go, Ali J. Yeah. Yeah. And digging up septic tanks. There you go, Mayor Space. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Yeah. Here, one of the dinosaurs that's not mentioned in that command is uh, this critter. This is an Alvarosaurid. This is Mononychus, but I dug up a... Or helped... My crew dug up, I should say. Jack Wilson is the one who actually found the, the key claw. Uh, this is a dinosaur called Triarchuncus. This is supposed to be Mononychus, but Triarchuncus would look... You know... It's the same critter as this, basically. Really weird, kind of small dinosaur. Maybe about five or six feet long, full-grown. Probably smaller. Really long, stilty legs. Long, flexible neck. Mostly toothless mouth. They may have had teeth, but they were like tiny and peg-like, almost like that of an anteater. And they had these super short forelimbs with these ridiculously big claws on these super short limbs. And that's actually their thumb right there. So yeah, yeah, very cool critters. And uh, yeah, Trirarchuncus. Let me show you the, uh, the paper. Um... Let's see. That's not working. That's bizarre. Okay. Tree Rarcuncus. Uh, here we are. Yeah. Tree Rarcuncus prairiensis. The name means Captain Hook of the Prairie. Found uh, that key specimen, the one that allowed us, allowed us to publish this as a new genus and species. We found it on the American Prairie Reserve. In uh, central Montana. Hence, Triarchuncus prairiensis. Means from the prairie. Uh, the last Alvarosaurid. So this critter was around right before the asteroid hit. And ended the age of dinosaurs. And there's me. On the author list there. Oh yeah, I presented on this critter at SVP. The Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. Back in uh, 2013. So yeah. Yeah. Those the shadows in the background, the music, Pascal? Uh, nope, the nebulas, apparently. Yeah. But uh, sharp ears there, Pascal. We listen to surf rock here. It's, it's good background music. It's nice and upbeat. It's not too distracting. Yeah. 
And was that another Iguanodon scenario for Bit with that spike? Sarah on caffeine? Yeah, this. See the little nose horn? This is a Victorian picture of Iguanodon. When this critter was first dug up back in the, the early 1800s, early 19th century, we didn't have very many bones of it. And so, uh, yeah, Victorian scientists, trying to figure out what it looked like, came up with this picture here. Uh, very different from our modern perception of Iguanodon. Which is much more like this. Here we go. Yeah. Iguanodon. Quadrupedal animal. Mostly quadrupedal. It could probably get up and run on its hind legs if it wanted to. But yeah, those thumb spikes are there on the thumbs. It was originally only one was found, and I think I think Richard Owen was of the opinion that it was probably on the animal's nose. And uh, other like other scientists at the time disagreed, but he kind of overrode them in making that model there. But uh, yeah, Iguanodon. I dug up a related dinosaur this past summer in eastern Utah. A kind of Iguanodont. It's an animal from the same family. And uh, that very well might get described as a new species. If it does turn out to be distinct. We need to go back this summer, uh, this coming summer, get some more of it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Bambi S says, good morning all. How you doing, Bambi? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And, uh, Puthisaurus says, how do you decide? Puthisaur says, how do you decide where to dig? It's a good question. It depends what you're after. So, for instance, say you, let's say, for instance, you would like to go out and find... I don't know. Let's say, um, let's say Deinonychus. You know, this critter here. You know, everybody knows Deinonychus. This is the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. We know it actually looked much more like this in life. Or, uh, or like that. There we go. Oh, these are so small. Give me a big one here. Um, there we go. Deinonychus. Uh, like this. Yeah. Or, I guess like, uh, that's not a very good one either. Anyway, it's a dromaeosaur. One of these, uh, meat-eating dinosaurs. Uh, sickle clawed. These are often referred to as raptors by Jurassic Park fans, or Jurassic World fans. Anyway, yeah. Deinonychus. There we go. Let's scoot that over. Kabow! There we go. Deinonychus. Say you want to find fossils of Deinonychus. That's your research interest. You want more specimens because you've got an interesting study planned. How would you go about doing that? I'll tell you. The first thing you do, you've got to figure out what age rocks they come from. Deinonychus has been found in the Cloverleaf Formation from the early Cretaceous period. And so... Yeah, here, let's go click on Cloverleaf Formation here. Uh, yeah, there we go, Cloverleaf Formation. So, a lot of people don't realize it, but much of the world has already been mapped out in geologic maps. And so, let's say... Geologic map of Montana, for instance. There we go. Yeah. So these different colors on this map of the U.S. state of Montana represent different ages of rocks. Deinonychus, you're only going to find it in rocks from the early Cretaceous period, and only from that sliver that represents the same time span as the Cloverleaf Formation. So you consult maps like this, and then you find rocks of the right, the right color on here. And what would you know? A lot of these around here... There's a Deinonychus there. Uh, Nighthawka. Thank you. Nighthawka CA. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. You know, there's a bunch of rocks of the right color right around here. Like south central Montana. Interesting. 
And so basically what you would do is you pinpoint some spots where the rocks are of the right age, and then you might consult some satellite maps. Um, you might go to Google Earth. Um, yeah, so let's do um, satellite map of, is it Billings County, Montana? And what you're looking for here is areas that are not forested. You're looking for areas... Oh, there we go. Uh, you're looking for areas where you can look at the bare rock right there. Because that's how we find fossils in the first place. So, I guess... Yeah, satellite map. There we go. Google Maps or Google Earth are usually much better for this kind of thing. But you're looking for what we call, often like, Badlands to topography. Uh, areas like this that kind of look like desert. There's just bare rock everywhere, exposed to the surface. Because this is how we find dinosaurs. It's not like we just go and, you know, we walk into a forest and we dig a random hole somewhere and hope for the best. No, what we do is we... Uh, we go to an area like this. And we walk. You walk around, you look at the ground, you look for bits of fossil bone that are sticking out. And then you try and identify them. That's really the most difficult part of the whole job is being able to identify tiny little fragments of bone and figure out, A, what bone is it, from what part of the body, from what kind of animal, and then after you figure that out, you determine, is it worth digging in here and seeing if there is more? There's a lot of false starts, you know? You pick up a lot of junk before you ever see anything that's promising. You know, it might be one in a hundred things that you pick up that are actually worth, like, digging in further to see if they go anywhere. Sometimes if you get really, really lucky, it really turns into something. So yeah, that's how we determine where to dig. Does that make sense? It's like a stepwise process. But it, it's all determined by, like, what are we interested in, you know? Which, uh, which age rocks should we explore for? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, but let's see here. Mm-hmm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, I'm building stages for 20 years now and did some world tours with a few big names. Very cool, Pascal. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, Steve says, I'm curious on your thoughts on the news to de-extinct the dodo bird. We're going to have to look that up. Other people in chat have mentioned that. Um, I apparently have not heard the news about that yet, so we'll probably cover that later. And I've never played Ark, uh, Putty Sour. I might do it later for a fundraiser. i got to buy myself a generator for fieldwork streams this summer. If I'm going to have satellite internet in the field to stream with, I need to get a generator for that, and those cost a lot of money. So I got to do a fundraiser stream, and maybe maybe we'll do some ARC stuff for that, because I never have before. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. And Edobot says, shouldn't Arizona have more dinosaurs? Arizona's got a lot of dinosaurs, Edobot. Yeah. Arizona... Has got Petrified Forest National Park for one. Yeah. Um, most of Arizona's dinosaurs are from the Triassic period. But uh, yeah, there is a big old tree petrified like that at Petrified Forest National Park. Um, the thing is, many of the rocks that you have there in Arizona, like these are all Triassic in age. And uh, the Triassic period is the first of three periods in the Age of Dinosaurs. Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. And the Triassic period is when dinosaurs first evolved. Probably about there. And like maybe the latest part of the middle Triassic. And dinosaurs don't really get big until the Jurassic period. They're pretty small during the Triassic. And they're not super common yet. Uh, so Arizona does have a few dinosaurs. More dinosaurs than most U.S. states do. But from what I understand, many of Arizona's sedimentary rocks are from the Triassic period. From before dinosaurs really made it big. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. 
And if you do play Ark, can we join you in a server? I don't know if I'm actually going to play it, Jody Fish, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Spaces, and sometimes this is true. Mayor Spaces making a really good point here. Many of the fossils that we have as, like, in museums were from, they're found by regular people. I'll show you an example of that. Um. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, one of the most famous dinosaurs in the world, one that actually makes many appearances here on this channel, are yes emotes, or actually this particular Tyrannosaurus specimen called the Wonkle Rex. It's called the Wonkle Rex because the lady who found it, Kathy Wonkle, that's her name. Let's uh, let her talk about that a little bit. Uh... Our family was camped at Fort Peck, which is a, a dam and a reservoir in eastern Montana. Yep. It was Labor Day weekend of 1988. What we found was about this much sticking out of the bank. Yep. And we dug around a little bit. We were just looking for pieces of fossils. We never dreamed we'd find the entire thing, the bones <laughs> stayed in our house, in our basement, till we could bring them to Bozeman. This is where I used to live, Bozeman, Montana. Uh, that would have been Thanksgiving of 1988. Pat, uh, gee, I'm sure they have a lot of people that bring I used to work at this museum. And buffalo bones. And so he was kind of ho-hum. Um, it was dark out, I believe, and I remember great big snowflakes falling, and he came <laughs> out to our station wagon, took one look, and his eyes got huge. We were pretty excited. <laughs> we stood out there a long time. All afternoon and the next day, <laughs> piecing it together. Because it was, like I said, it was fragmented. I mean, it was only one thing it could be. It was the arm of a T-Rex. Yep. Pretty cool stuff. So the point is... The ulna bone had never been found yeah. before on a T-Rex. So they were very excited. Wanted to know if um, we could find the spot and show... This is extremely important. So, yeah. Many dinosaurs are actually found by, you know, regular people. Maybe, like, I don't know if it's the... It's probably not the majority of dinosaur fossils. Probably not even close. But a significant proportion are found by regular people. Because dinosaur paleontologists are few and far between. But there are a lot of people out there, you know, in the areas that you find dinosaur fossils. You know, they're walking their dogs. They're bird watching, they're hunting, they're hiking, they're camping, they're doing whatever. And they find things. And here's a piece of advice, something that Kathy Wonkel did absolutely right. If you ever stumble across what you think is an important fossil, the most important thing to remember is where you found it. You may not realize it, but you actually have a GPS device that you carry around with you almost all the time, your smartphone. You can, if you, I think most phones have a built-in feature for this. You can figure it out if you, uh, if you want to, but you can, like, log GPS locations using your phone. And if you don't know how to do that, just take, like, some panoramic photos, stand in one spot, turn around, get the horizon at all angles, and that'll help you re relocate the site. Second thing to remember is... Try not to disturb the fossil. You know? Don't hack away at it. Don't take pieces home. Kathy Wonkel did, and you're, that's not really the best thing to do, but she did that so she could bring it to the museum, and they probably wouldn't have believed her if she hadn't brought them the arm of a T-Rex that nobody had ever seen before. Like the ulna bone there. Never been found. So her bringing that to the museum was a big deal. So she did the right thing, even if it's not, like, technically what you're supposed to do. But yeah. Email photos to your local museum. Go and try and talk to the paleontologist there. You know? Important dinosaur finds and important fossil finds of all kinds. Almost. Almost all kinds. 
are made by interested amateurs, by regular people. Yeah. And uh, nowadays, Kathy Wonkle, her name will live forever. Because she found the Wonkle Rex, you know? It's pretty cool. MOR 555, which we actually ended up sending to the Smithsonian in, uh, in Washington, D.C. There we go, yeah. In Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian. So, I mean, you can't help but be proud about that. But, um... I'm getting choked up. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's a big day. Yeah. I was there for this. I don't think I show up in any of the footage, but, uh... Yeah. They made a big deal out of setting this thing. I remember some of my colleagues in the lab were, uh... And they were not super happy about that. They're like, why are they putting on this big show for this kind of thing? If we had just a fraction of the money that they spent on this big production, we could go out and find three more T-Rexes, you know? But I don't know. It's going to the Smithsonian, and they like to make a big hurrah about things, so... Yeah. Um... Anyway, if you see a bone, leave it alone, unless... Go, Golgonek. T Matt Tricks is how fast did T Rex run? It depends which uh, which T Rex we're talking about, T Matt Tricks, because T Rex. Uh, changed a lot as it grew and matured. So. Here, take a look at this. This is from the Saurian game here. A young Tyrannosaurus, like this, like the one that you see behind me right here. They've got very long, lanky legs. Probably very fast runners. Probably very fast when they're young. Up until they get to be about 50% adult size, they've got really long, lanky legs. And, uh... Yeah, let's see here. Where's that other illustration? Um, do, 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 do. where did that go? Shoot. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Image a new tab. Yeah. So, even when they're about this big, really long, leggy legs like that probably would have been very fast animals. But by the time they get to adult size, they'd probably slow down considerably. So they're probably going from, like, fast, active pursuit predators to having a big growth spurt and becoming, like, much more slow, powerful ambush predators uh, throughout their lives. It's interesting stuff. This is the same animal at different growth stages. Like a lot of dinosaurs, these critters are probably moving through different ecological niches throughout their lifespan, which is not something that most animals... Mammals don't do that today. Almost without exception, mammals do not do this. Um, so it's interesting stuff. Yeah. The juvenile Rexes look even scarier to you, Joe, Joe Mimo. I mean, they would have been speed demons. Yeah. Um, cool stuff. Very cool stuff. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. So I hope that, I hope that makes sense to you, Team at Tricks. These animals changed a lot as they grew, and their top speed would... You know, be reflected in that. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, looks like an ostrich when it's young. It does, friendly neighborhood Mexican. It does indeed. I mean, look at those long legs. It is a lot like an ostrich. And as we know, ostriches are very fast runners. Um... Holy cow. Take a look at this. <laughs> Here's some bicyclists in South Africa, I want to say. And look at that ostrich. <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. These things are speed demons. They are very, very fast. Like, fast enough to chase down a bicyclist. 
uh, faster than an Olympic sprinter. They are the fastest animals on two legs. Would a juvenile Tyrannosaurus be that fast? Uh, maybe not quite that fast, but they would have been pretty fast, you know? Yeah. In fact, we have a video about this. Um, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Solemnus, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so this guy, I think, is a... Is he a sprinter or a football player? I want to say he's a football player. Contest. The ostrich left Dennis in the dust without even trying. Without even trying. That bird is fast. <laughs> well, I ended up going top gear because the ostrich start moving. I'm trying to get away from it. Dennis's top gear is nowhere near as fast as the ostriches. Uh uh. Here's Not even why. close. Speed <laughs> is a product of downforce and stride length. With each step, the ostrich produces an explosive 1,900 pounds of force to... Holy cow. Wow. That's more than twice as much as the 900 pounds a human can generate. Yeah. The ostrich's ability to produce force rapidly was remarkable. We're talking the fastest numbers we've ever seen and over two times faster than the best athletes we've seen. The hmm. powerful downforce allows the... And look at... Oh, hang on a second. Sorry, I was trying to pause it and instead I turned off the volume. My volume thing on here. Uh, anyway, look at those those long, lanky legs. Look at those right there. And then look at our Tyrannosaurus. Very similar legs, you could say. Yeah. Uh, here. Image and tab. Basically the same kind of deal right there. Why are they so similar? Well, it's because birds and dinosaurs... Well, birds are dinosaurs. These are both theropod dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus and the ostrich. That's why they've got the same legs. We call that homology, you know? They both inherited these traits from a common ancestor. This is not convergence, it's homology. Um, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, this critter probably would have been pretty fast. Pretty fast. ...to take a stride up to 16 feet long. Yeah. Only three times greater than Dennis's. <laughs> this amazing power and massive stride is why these birds are, in fact, the fastest two-legged creatures on the planet. There you go. What's more impressive is that even though Thelma breezed to victory going 26 miles per hour, <laughs> her top speed is a blazing 45 miles an hour. Oh, man. Yeah. Dennis gave it his all. But he's no match for the fastest creature on two feet. <laughs> I got him. But when I start chasing him, he was playing with me like you try to, your kid trying to catch you. You just like kind of play with him until they get close and you run away from him. The was just totally just playing with me today. Oh, yeah. Report, great speed in the 40, but she's got no hands. <laughs> anyway, yeah, good stuff. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Joe Mimo says cassowary birds are pretty much as scary as Deinonychus. I mean, they've certainly killed more people than Deinonychus has. Except maybe in the Jurassic Park films. Um, yeah. Here, I know we watched this before, but the cassowary bird is a relative of the ostrich. They are still around today. Uh, probably my very favorite extant bird. They're super cool. Um, but yeah, do not mess with them. It's a Oof. What prompted such a desperate call to 911? It's a vicious physical attack. Not from a human being, but from a bird. A bird called a cassowary. Just like yeah. the behind me. It's known as the most dangerous bird in the world. The cassowary is a close descendant of the fierce velociraptors. 
a close descend. It's not actually descended from. So Velociraptor Dromaeosaurs don't have any living relatives. Not not any no living descendants. I mean, excuse me. These guys. This is a terrible depiction from Jurassic World. Garbage. You know, it would have looked. Well, I had that image pulled up a while ago. Um, in reality, Deinonychus would look even more bird-like than that. Uh, yeah. There we go. When you're thinking Deinonychus, think, uh, think this critter. There we go. There's a lovely Deinonychus. Is that by Gabriele Guetto? I think it is. Excellent stuff. Look at those claws. Holy moly. Yeah. Um, these are not a good depiction of these animals. They, they weren't scaly like this. They had feathers all over their bodies. Um, anyway. Yeah. In Jurassic World. Stand there. Who would keep such a creature as a pet? This mm. did. Florida man. Marvin Hajos of suburban Gainesville, Florida. His urgent call to 911 came after he was attacked by his pet cassowary. In a fight between cassowary and man, he didn't stand a chance. Somehow, nope. Hajos yeah. was able to call a friend, who then placed his own call to 911, urging police to get there quickly. He sounded really frantic on the phone. All he said was send an ambulance, send an ambulance, send an ambulance. Zookeeper Debbie Morganson uses a rake, especially during breeding season, when the birds are protecting their Look eggs. at that beautiful egg. Hang on, take a look at that egg. Especially during breeding season, when the birds are protecting their eggs. And look at that beautiful egg right there. Holy cow, it's like a big piece of fruit. Um, Really, really cool. For whatever reason, it seems like forest-dwelling birds, forest-dwelling, mostly terrestrial birds, like uh, ratites, you know, cassowaries, emus, uh, tinamous, they've got very brightly colored eggs. And it might be like an evolutionary adaptation to get the males to go sit on the eggs because the males are actually the ones who take care of the eggs, not the females. It's like a single dad kind of a situation um, where like different females will come to the same male who builds a nest and they'll breed with him and lay their eggs in his nest and then he takes care of them. It's really interesting stuff. But that might be why these eggs developed these uh, really bright colors like this is because it behooves the female to make sure that the eggs are brightly colored so that the male has to sit on them and tend to them and take care of them. But, uh... The main thing you worry about is yeah. their feet. It's their most deadly weapon. She's correct. Yeah. Cassowaries don't bite. They use their claws, which can grow four inches long. Oh, yeah. He uses a thick shield to protect himself during an attack. So more like running at you and, and kicking you and jumping at you with those, with those feet and like a velociraptor. They're gonna... <laughs> shred you pretty quick <laughs> wildlife expert jared miller says the dead man might have made a mistake it's a situation where a little slip up like like a trip and fall definitely gave that large bird an advantage to death. Oof. yeah anyway imagine how much more severe the wounds would be from an animal with claws like this you know claws on its hands too for crying out loud Holy cow, Deinonychus. That's such a oh, it's such a good illustration here. I love this. Good stuff. And hey, M. Maddie M. How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. They do not mess around. Very true. Joe Mimo. Cassowaries and probably Deinonychus too. Yeah. Uh, imagine Gallimimus kick. Yeah, they can kick you in half, Dr. Terra. That would not be pretty. Um, so yeah, yeah. And Dr. Terry, yes, indeed. Um, cassowaries are very expensive to keep and illegal in most places. I think Florida might be one of the only U.S. states where you can legally keep them. Because, you know, everything's legal in Florida except um, books. Hmm. Anyway, talk about a cranky Queenslander. There you go, Bambi S. Yeah. <laughs> Is that an archetype down there, down under? Cranky Queenslander. Interesting. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll see you soon, Lenina. You enjoy your food. And uh, an astronomy shows his bright colors sometimes worn off predators. That's true if it's like something that's poisonous. Or yeah. But usually I don't, it seems like eggs are usually like colored cryptically. 
eggs are usually supposed to be camouflaged. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. That's that's an interesting point there. Yeah. And they'll eviscerate it. Yeah, they will disembowel a person. Friendly, yeah. Um, Friendly says, I had some old Navy buds that went to Australia for a humanitarian mission, and they were briefing them on emus, and said that to, uh, said that to them and not to mess with them. And those are just emus. Emus do not have that wicked claw that cassowaries have. Um, yeah. So there is the foot of a cassowary. Look at that murderous claw. I mean, holy cow, look at that. That is an evisceration weapon. Let me show you an emu foot by comparison. I happen to have one right here. Uh, this is the foot of an emu right here. This is a resin cast like an exact copy molded and cast from the original. Uh, but it's made of plastic. It's resin. But there is that equivalent claw to here. See the big claw right there? It's a lot smaller on an emu right here. Emus kind of have more hoof-like claws, especially on digits three and four. Uh, yeah... So anyway, emus can still be pretty ornery, and if they kick you, they can definitely tear you open, but not as easily as, say, a cassowary. I mean, holy cow. Look at that right there. <laughs> oh my goodness. One, two, three, four, five. That's a five-inch claw. Um, that's nuts. Yeah, really crazy. So don't mess with cassowaries. Or emus. Or, you know, let's just make that a blanket statement to all birds. Don't mess with them, you know? Uh, it's not nice to mess with birds. And sometimes they'll mess with you right back. And they will end you. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, anywho. Yeah. Yeah. Don't mess with dinosaurs. There you go, Origin TT. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And why not have eggs that can be poisonous, says Tactile? I think because that'd be really bad for the embryo in the egg if it were poisonous, you know? Yeah. Um. Yeah. And, uh, Dr. Terrace says Rhea are the only non-kickers. Really, do Rhea's not kick? History. Let's take a look at our Tree of Life real quick. We'll jump from the odd toad ungulates, which we were looking at earlier, to... Is Rattites still a group? Rattites and Tinamous. There we go. Let's go all the way over to birds, away from the mammals. There we go. Rattites and Tinamous. Paleonath birds. Southern Cassowary, Greater Rhea. And then Tinamou, 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 Moa, and Ostrich. I'm surprised they have Moas on here. This tree almost has no, almost no extinct animals. I guess they're recently extinct enough that they're on here. But, uh... Anyway, yeah. The Greater and Lesser Rhea are right there. And it doesn't seem like they're super close to our... Ostrich and Tinamu, are they? Or, or Ostrich and Cassowary. And Emu. Where are they? There's the Ostrich. Early diverging. There's our Cassowaries and Emus right there. Cassowaries and emus are each other's closest living relatives, which makes a lot of sense, given their biogeography. Yeah, there's three living species of cassowary, and then we've got emus. Yeah, um, very cool birds, very cool birds. Uh, some animals have a high immune system or immune to their own poison. I guess tactile, but I don't know if any. I don't know if any birds have venomous or, excuse me, poisonous eggs. I just don't think it's something that's ever evolved, you know? Yeah. It's a good question, but I can't think of any birds with poisonous eggs off the top of my head. Yeah. Anyway. 
And uh, Bubble Ray, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. <laughs> and yeah, Gar do have poison sticks, don't they, Dr. Terra? That's a good point. Yeah. Scout says plovers are the scariest birds ever. Scout, are you secretly a little beach invertebrate that lives in sand? Because I could see why you'd be very scared of plovers. <laughs> if you're like a little shrimpy guy that lives in beach sand, plovers would be terrifying. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Eagle Star Trekker says high amounts of silica in the eggshell would seriously mess up any predator's day. But I don't think there are any birds that have the ability to secrete silica like that. And sometimes birds will actually eat their own eggshell in order to, like, recoup some of the calcium in it. Like, mother birds will do that, I think. Silica would... Yeah. I don't, I don't know if animals can produce silica. Maybe somebody in chat knows of an example, probably some sort of invertebrate, that's able to secrete silica. I don't know of any vertebrate animals that can do that. Yeah. Um, and the pitohuai is the only poisonous bird. I think you're right, Origin TT. Let's look up, look at that real quick. Yeah. And friendly, the platypus is a mammal. Let's jump to platypus real quick. Uh, yeah, ornithorhynchos. <laughs> Octavius King. Yeah. came here to experience poultry in motion. Thank you, Octavius King, for the raid. Welcome, welcome back to Paleontologizing. How is everything? How are the rats doing? How's life, Octavius? It's great to see you here. Thank you so much for joining us. And if anybody's here for the very first time, like maybe you, Megbop Double Eight. I don't recognize that name. Hey, Deepest Blue Dragon, how are you doing? Welcome back. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Right now, we're talking about different critters, including living dinosaurs, birds, talking about how they're related to each other and all that good stuff. Once again, Octavius, how was your stream? I hope it was really, really good. Thank you for bringing everybody here. I appreciate that more than you know. Uh, welcome, welcome. If anybody's got any questions, do not be shy. Yeah. Somebody was just asking me if the platypus is a bird, and no, the platypus is a mammal. So a platypus is way more closely related to you and me than it is to any bird. It's a mammal. The platypus feed their young with milk. Um, I don't know, they've got a lot of, lot of other mammalian traits. They've got hair and stuff like that, but they're one of the last surviving monotremes. These are egg-laying mammals. Uh, the echidna is another monotreme right there. Yeah, monotremes. There you go. Yeah, but platypus are mammals. Um, but, uh... How do I pronounce this? Potohui? Um... Only venomous bird. Pitohui, okay. Um... Yeah, there we go. There we go. Way over there to the birds. Zoom. Let's take a look at these reportedly poisonous birds. Poisonous, not venomous, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, the first scientifically confirmed poisonous bird. Let's see here. Whoop, here we go. Let's have ourselves a look. A student working in New Guinea, and we were studying something completely different. We were studying the mating behavior of Rajiana birds of paradise. We had about 40 mist nets up in the forest, and as we were taking birds out of our mist net, um, one day I was handling a number of hooded pitahuis that fell into our nets and as i took these birds out of the net pitahui that's how you pronounce it and for some reason our captions are automatically in portuguese let's make that english instead shall we yeah that'll be good here 
When I was a graduate student working in New Guinea, and we were studying something completely different, we were studying the mating behavior of Rajiana birds of paradise, we had about 40 mist nets up in the forest, and yeah. we were taking birds out of our mist net. Um, one day I was handling a number of hooded pitahuis that fell into our nets, and as I took mm -hmm. these birds out of the nets, they bit my hand, the cuts really stung, but we had so many nets to, to care for, we didn't have time to, to stop and, um, and put band-aids on our cuts, so we popped our fingers in our mouths, we ran off to the next net. Sometimes this is how scientific discoveries are made. Sometimes it's not something that happens in a laboratory under controlled conditions, you know, knowing what you're going to find. Sometimes it's you're working with birds in nets and you cut your hands and, you know, and then you make a discovery that way. Um, you know, this is like I was saying, you don't always know how field work is going to go. Case in point. Yeah. Now, after handling the pitahuis, our mouths began to tingle and burn and even go numb. And the sensation lasted for several hours and a once or twice, even overnight. So we went and we asked our local huh. guides. We said, what do you know about these birds? They appear to be poisonous to us. This is really, really cool. We're you know, harnessing local knowledge. These people have lived here for time immemorial. They know just about every critter that's there, uh, you know, sharing this environment with them. And uh, what are they going to say, I wonder? Yeah. So we went and we asked our local guides. We said, what do you know about these birds? They appear to be poisonous to us. And they said, oh, yeah, those are rubbish birds. They're good for nothing. You can't even eat those birds. <laughs> and so we immediately started a study on, the, on those birds, the hooded pitahuis. Oh, they're so, so cool. The type of poison that pitahuis use in their feathers is a steroidal alkaloid neurotoxin. So let's break wow. that down. So steroidal? What did he say? Alkaloid neurotoxin? Who is used in their feathers is a steroidal alkaloid neurotoxin. Alkaloid so let's break neurotoxin. that down. So it can cause, at first, the, the, the tingling, the numbing sensation. Uh, in higher Ooh. doses, it can lead to paralysis, cardiac arrests, and death. So it is one of the gram for gram. It's one of the most <laughs> toxic natural substances known. So wow. You may wonder why we study these poisonous birds. But there's a couple why not? of different reasons. Yeah. One, I think that these toxins are very interesting. They have biological activity. They have been patented in the past. And one of the reasons that they've never been developed into any drugs is because we never had a source of them that was big enough for us to do the experiments that we needed to do to understand how to turn these into a usable thing. With huh. the Pitahui example and with, and now that we figured Yeah, I'm sure weapons contractors would be very interested in developing this further. <laughs> I'm mostly kidding. Um, yeah, oftentimes you can take really interesting chemical components from living things like this, and you can develop new medications and treatments and stuff based on them. So I'm sure that's what they were more interested in. Source yeah. of them that was big enough for us to do the experiments that we needed to do to understand how to turn these into a usable thing. With the Pitahui example, and with, and now that we've figured out where the Pitahuis get their toxins from a small beetle in New Guinea, there's some potential that this uh. might be developed in the future. Interesting stuff. Very interesting, actually. And, uh, yeah, let's take a look at this. Also from the California Academy of Sciences. When I was a graduate student in the field, um, taking birds out of the nets, these pitahuis are J-sized birds with very strong, sharp beaks and big claws, and they can easily scratch... He must be giving a presentation here at the California Academy of Sciences. I'm going to be visiting here, hopefully very soon, because I have some of my own research to do in their collections. Looking at some, uh, well, I won't say looking at what critters yet, but I'm going to be going to be looking at some critters at the California Academy of Sciences. I'm very excited about that. This is for uh, some some research that I'm going to be presenting in June in Salt Lake City at the Mesozoic Terrestrial Ecosystems Conference at the Utah Museum of Natural History or Natural History Museum of Utah. Tomato potato. Uh, Anyway, yeah, does it start with an S, says Mommy Does? It ends with an S if you if you have more than one of them, Mommy Does. If it's plural, it ends with an S, sure. Your hands. And when yeah. I was taking them out of the nets as a graduate student, they scratched my hands and really hurt. So the first thing I did was I popped my finger in my mouth and licked my cut, ran off to the next net, and then my mouth began to tingle and burn. And until it happened a second time to one of our other researchers, um, hmm. I we didn't realize what happened, but then we put our stories together and we started to suspect that actually the, the toxins came from the birds and not something else. This is, I love this story so much because this is how a lot of scientific discovery happens. Like, 
you notice something weird. They're, you're doing field work, and it's like, that's bizarre. What? <laughs> that's the cool thing about science is you never know what you're going to discover. You, you, you can never predict it. When you're out there on the very frontiers of human knowledge, you never know what awesome, unknown new pieces of inf information are out there. You never know which discoveries you're going to make. Because you're off in the unknown. To me, that's one of the most exciting things about science. Else that we've been touching, and when we went to ask the local folks about it, they said, "Oh yeah, those, those birds are poisonous, and you shouldn't be touching those." <laughs> so, so back when I was a graduate student, we started working on these birds, and uh, we teamed up with folks at the National Institutes of Health. And uh, after a couple years of research, we were able to isolate and identify uh, the compound that's responsible for the toxicity. And this is it here. It's called it's called the trachotoxin. Um, it's in a uh, a family of compounds known as toxins, and they're steroidal alkaloid neurotoxins. And they're steroidal because they have this steroid-like base. They're alkaloidal because they have this basic nitrogen that's contained in a ring structure that gives it the properties of an alkaloid. And it's a neurotoxin because it binds to voltage-gated sodium channels in such a way that when the channel is, is uh, activated and opened, it holds it in the open conformation. And what this does is it prevents the cell from being able to to pump the sodium to one side of the, of the cell and reestablish the ionic potential that's needed for that cell firing. And so it incapacitates nerve and muscle membranes and what caused it to exactly what caused the numbing and tingling sensation that we <laughs> felt. But in higher doses, it can actually cause paralysis and death. Um, wow. This has been known. Um, gram for gram, the toxins are among the most toxic natural substances known, more toxic than curare or strychnine. Really? And everything wow. that's been studied, basically, to date, uh, with the exception of one species that I'll talk about, um, they all seem to be sensitive to the toxins, and they seem to be poisoned huh. by the toxins. So basically, everything with a central nerve system that uses voltage-gated sodium Pretty channels, universal. Um, is poisoned by, this, by these compounds. Interesting stuff. toxin means frog poison. Yeah. So these toxins were previously known and identified, especially um, there you in go, Alex Vixen. poison dart frogs from Central and South America. See, Alex Vixen, I want to point out that Alex Vixen typed this in before this showed up on the screen. You're absolutely right, Alex Vixen, yeah. Uh, but trichotoxin, the toxin the Pituhuai have, is in the same family as that of poison dart frogs. Yes, indeed. Especially um, in the Phyllobates, poison dart frogs from Central and South America. Yeah! Terribles, the most toxic <laughs> of all. And of the 170 to 200 species of poison dart frogs that have been described in the world, only three species have actually been used for poisoning dart tips. And those are the huh. Phyllobates frogs, and they contain exactly the same poisons as our Pitahui birds in New Guinea. Not similar, but exactly Interesting. the same. And in fact, in, in the year 2000, along with our colleagues from National Institutes of Health, we described several new toxins that we found only from the birds. And when they went back to the old frog poisons, they were able to find some of those same poisons uh, in the frogs as well. So it appears as though they're using exactly the same poisons as these uh, Phyllobates frogs. Wow. Interesting stuff. Yeah, here's a link if you'd like to uh, hear more about that. There you go. But yeah, yeah. It's kind of like koalas that eat poisonous stuff. Exactly, t -matrix. These guys eat poisonous beetles, apparently. That's what makes them poisonous. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. And are those boats eating the frogs? I think they're eating beetles. Jody fish, which might be the same thing that the frogs are eating. Yeah, the frogs and the birds have the same diet. I think their diet does have some overlap there, Angel Wolf. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, the frogs eat poisonous ants. Is that right, Origin TT? Well, let's look that up real quick. Um, Pitohuai birds. There you go. Here's the hooded Pitohuai. This is the same one that we saw there in the video. Yeah. Uh, ecology calls, diet and feeding, toxicity. Yeah. Uh, and I guess in 1990, scientists were preparing the skins of the hooded pedal wife for museum collections, and they reported toxicity there. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, they're not 
so these birds are not thought to create the compound themselves, but instead sequester the toxins from their diet. Phylobates frogs kept in captivity do not develop the toxins, and the extent of the toxicity varies in both the pedophiles across the range and also across the range of unrelated blue-capped ifrit, another New Guinean bird found with toxic skin and feathers. So shoot, we've got another poisonous bird right here. Do we have any videos about them, I wonder? Um, hmm. There we go. Here's a neat video about this. Let's see, well, let's see if this is any good. Let's take a look. Birds have some amazing solutions to life's problems. Like sure. the problem of predators. Normally birds will just hide or fly away from predators. But there are some other birds that have found a different solution. They are yeah. literally poisonous. They fire lasers out of their... Oh, no, they're poisonous. Sorry, never mind. Let's find out how and why these poisonous birds exist. How, why, and when these poisonous birds exist. The when being today. The Pitahui are a group of brightly colored birds native to New Guinea. And the bright color is a warning. The sting and shrike and thrush. Of Interesting, Alex. Contain a nerve poison called batrachotoxin. Yeah. Toxin is the same deadly poison produced in poison dart frogs. I love that there's a visual representation of the toxin right here. So if any of you are ever walking around, say you like you see this, you know, lying in the middle of a parking lot, don't pick it up and eat it. You know. And for any UK or you know Commonwealth viewers watching right now, if you're in a, I hope I'm saying this right, a car park. And you see this lying there on the asphalt. Uh, don't pick it up and eat it. Likewise for this kind of frog, you know? Um, yeah. It permanently binds to nerve cells and turns off their ability to send and receive <laughs> signals. For an exposed animal, this results in numbness, paralysis, or death. Or worse. Almost all species of pitawi have this poison. And the most poisonous is the hooded pitawi. Oh man, don't even look at it. Touching this bird exposes the skin to batrachotoxin and causes yeah. numbness. But none of the pitawi actually produce batrachotoxin. It comes from their diet by yep. eating poisonous beetles like this one. Mm -hmm. These beetles make their own batrachotoxin, ideally protecting themselves from predators. Hmm. But their poison does not harm the pitawi. I couldn't find information on why the pitahui is not poisoned. But Maybe it is. Dark frogs, it's because they have <laughs> modified nerve channels that are unaffected by the poison. Interesting. So pitahui huh. <laughs> are able to eat these beetles and concentrate their poison in their feathers and skin. That's and pretty cool. They bio sequester it. To eat the pitahui, they get a mouthful of batrachotoxin. That's very Over cool. Time, predators have learned to stay away from the pitahui. I would too. Yeah, I wonder if we, if these birds continue to uh, to do their thing for a long time. Where did our? Oh shoot! Did I lose that? Um, let's look them up on the Tree of Life again. Let's see how these animals are doing conservation wise. Hopefully, quite well. Um. Yeah, crested pitohui. Because if they are allowed to continue to survive for much longer and continue to evolve, maybe they eventually will develop offensive poison capabilities, venom capabilities. Maybe it'll evolve from a from a poison into a venom, and they'll be able to, you know, fire projectiles of this poison at <laughs> predators. I, uh, I'm just spitballing here, you know? But, uh, yeah, least concern, it says. Good for them. You know, they're doing pretty well, it seems. Uh, look. Well, I have a... That looks like a V-Moth? Hang on a minute. Here, let me put this video going again. I'm gonna go release this moth outside. It's caught it in my hand. So, I will be right back. You enjoy the video until I return are more unrelated groups of birds that have found these poisonous beetles. The blue-capped ifrit also stores batrachotoxin in its feathers. 
so does the Rufus Shrike Thrush. An interesting thing about the Rufus Shrike Thrush is that it does not use warning colors to deter predators. This suggests a second use for Petrachotoxin, which is to deter parasites. For future reference, a good way to keep off mites and other parasites. He simply grew spears which projected from his body armor. Or you can do that to deter predators, like Chua. Thank you for the follow, Chua. Welcome to Paleontologizing. And deter predators or parasites. You can simply grow spears. <laughs> Uh, anyway, thank you for the dinosaur deep dive there, Victarius. We will cover that in, uh, in just a minute here. This strike thrush is that yeah. it does not use warning colors to deter predators. This suggests a second use for petrachotoxin, which is to deter parasites. Hmm. For future reference, a good way to keep off mites and other parasites is to be coated in neurotoxins. Oh, I don't know if that's good advice to give to YouTube viewers. Um, so I will give for everybody watching here on Twitch right now, I will give you just a, uh, you know, blanket on recommendation. Do not coat yourself in neurotoxins to try and deter parasites. No matter how bad your, your parasites are, don't be applying neurotoxins like to yourself or in, especially ingesting them, you know, um, yeah, Truckhorn says the subtle glee of the narrator is unsettling. I mean, he's just happy to be talking about neurotoxins, you know? Who wouldn't be? Yeah. Good way to keep off mites and other parasites is to be coated in neurotoxins. <laughs> These three birds are <laughs> native pretty to gleeful, the huh? but an African yeah. bird called the spur-winged goose does the same uh, thing. I didn't know spurred wings goose did that. storing their poison. Very cool. These beetles are called blister beetles, and uh -huh. the poison is cantharidin. Cantharidin causes blisters and chemical burns. So good name, blister beetles. Oh, I thought it was because maybe they, they arrived in blister packaging, which is the, like, plastic clamshell packaging that's, like, impossible to take apart. Goose is able to eat these beetles without harm, which yeah. is a useful adaptation in its own way. But then it stores cantharidin in its tissues. So anything eating the goose will be chemically burned or poisoned. For the affected hmm. goose, this is not helpful, as they have already been eaten. But predators will either die or get a lesson in leaving the other spur-winged geese alone. There we go. Yeah, spur-winged geese solidarity. Is the European quail. During their migration, they eat... Really? Plants, They're poisonous too? an unknown plant will turn a quail poisonous. So... <laughs> the way you put that. There's so many poisonous birds. I had no idea. I had a vague awareness that there was a poisonous bird from New Guinea. I did not realize that, like... Shoot, every bird and his brother are, are poisonous here. Holy cow. Yeah. They eat plants. And an unknown plant will turn a quail poisonous. The poison is coney. Wait, so we don't know which plant does that? Also, by the way, really cool feathers. Those look like spines. So I already do not want to swallow this bird whole because those look like they would get stuck in my throat. Also, I don't eat birds on top of it. But knowing that they're poisonous, that's just that backs up that threat with something real. It's very cool. Their fat and muscle. Not all quail are poisonous. And not every predator who eats a poisonous quail will be affected. Hmm. But for those that are, the predator will experience muscle cell breakdown. Oh boy. So just as a, a general rule, don't go around just eating quail, you know? It's like playing Russian roulette. You never know which one is going to be poisonous, I guess. Um. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. There are a few other bird species confirmed poisonous, huh. like the Australian bronze wing and ruffed grouse. But really? There are hundreds more species which are distasteful to humans. We're probably not done discovering poisonous birds. Yeah, let's hope not. Birds have so many different survival Very strategies cool. that help them to stay Hang on, what do you say? To humans. All birds are distasteful to me in terms of tasting them. I don't. I don't like eating birds. Um, but yeah, yeah. Cool stuff. 
Birds are friends, not, not food. To Birds me. are just a reminder that there is so much more out there to learn. Oh yeah, it's so much more out there to poison you. Thanks for increasing your knowledge about birds. You're you welcome. Can Thank you. Video on this channel to keep learning about animal adaptations, or you can subscribe Very cool. to know when new videos come out. Thank and you can click this link right here if you'd like to watch this video and visit that guy's channel. Wow, there you go. I don't know why I'm feeling very froggy right now. Um, gee, bird flu, says Miss Yvette? That's a totally different thing. That's not a poison. That's a that's a virus. And Angel Wolf says, Who knew dinosaurs developed poison? Great defense against asteroids. Don't... Too soon, Angel Wolf. Too soon. It's only been 66 million years, Angel Wolf. My goodness. x says, So many dumb ways to die. <laughs> exactly, x -Row. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree, Miss Yvette. Birds are friends, not food. Adoja, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh... And, oh, and Lenina, thank you for highlighting that message there. Um, Scalawax is interestingly, quails are poisonous only during migration, and more specifically, while they are flying certain routes. For example, quails are not poisonous when they travel from East Africa to Europe during spring, but they are poisonous when they return to Africa in autumn. Interesting. So clearly that has something to do with, um, you know, the... The direction in which they're pointed as they're flying, that makes them poisonous. Surely it has nothing to do with whatever they're eating when they're there in Europe. <laughs> um, yeah. Here's why poisonous animals don't poison themselves. Toxic birds and frogs evolved a way to avoid harm, but not in the way we thought. What is this? In the forests of New Guinea. Ooh. We've got a, uh, here, some more appropriate music. Does this work? In the forests of New Guinea lives a small drab bird with a deadly secret. It's called the hooded pituhuai, and its orange and black feathers are laced with poison. Simply touching the feathers, Career. But enough about my work. What did you want to show me, Lee? Forsaken Oath, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Simply touching the feathers of a pitohuai is enough to make your hands feel like they're on fire. But in just a bit of the Batraca toxin, uh, called a BTX for short, didn't BTX just majorly crash? Like, all the crypto stuff is just flushing down the toilet right now, isn't it? Anyway, called BTX for short, and the poison stops your sodium channels from working, leading to paralysis and even death. Uh, you can think about the poisons as a kind of natural drug. It's something that the animals use to protect themselves because it either gives a very unpleasant feeling to the thing that's trying to eat them, or in the worst case, it kills the thing that's trying to eat them. Is that a worst case, or is that a best case right there if you're a prey animal? Says Daniel Miner, a biophysicist at the University of California. Yeah! Southern, uh, San Francisco's Cardiovascular Research Institute. Uh, scientists believe that the pedo does not manufacture its own toxins, but rather acquires them from its tiny beetle prey. Uh, the same mechanism is suspected in poison dart frogs of Central and South America, which also carry BTX in their brightly colored skin. All of which leads to an intriguing question. How do poisonous animals like the pitohuai keep from poisoning themselves? Uh, for decades, the best theory was that these birds and frogs evolved specially adapted sodium channels, a part of the body that's necessary for nerves, brain cells, and muscle cells to function properly, that are immune to BTX. After all, there are several examples of animals that shrug off toxins by this method, such as Egyptian mongoose, that can survive cobra venom. Interesting stuff. Uh, yeah. Anyway, if you'd like to read more, we're not going to dwell too much on this. It's right here. But check it out. Cool stuff. Yeah. Um. 
But yeah. Yeah. And, uh... Anywho. The liver, says Tactile. It might be part of it. Yeah. Sodium is very important, and uh, who knew blocking its axis could be deadly? Yeah, Angel Wolf. Holy moly. Yeah. Cool stuff. Very cool stuff. And I think I missed some some interesting chat messages earlier. Uh, Tactile says, Sea snakes have some of the most poisonous of any living thing, I think. It's venom in sea snakes. Yeah, Tactile. Holy cow. Like the beaked sea snake, I think, is one of the most deadly of all naturally occurring venoms. Um, outside of, like, cone snails, maybe. Beaked sea snake. Yeah. Uh, and are us Australian plovers poisonous? Oh, I don't know, Dinosaur Dave. Let's look into that. Or why don't why don't you look into that, Dinosaur Dave, and report back? That that sounds really interesting. Um. Yeah, I've got so many questions coming in. There's the beaked sea snake, one of the most venomous of all living things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here's a video called, from something called Tiny Medicine about this. Let's, let's have ourselves a look. Waves are not the only danger a fisherman has to face. The ocean is home to the most abundant venomous reptile on Earth, the sea snake. Okay. On a beautiful morning, one fisherman put his hands into the sea to collect the fish net he had laid the night before. Hmm. Unfortunately for him, a coral reef snake trapped in the net bit his hand. The panicked fisherman caught the snake and brought it to the hospital with him. Hmm. The fate of both the fisherman and the snake were now in our hands. In our hands? Wait, what? Is this... Goodness. This is one of those like translated videos, isn't it? Where it's like poorly translated through Google Translate or whatever. Truman and the snake survived. Oh boy. Find out today on Tiny Medicine. We didn't okay. the fisherman with antivenom. In the next minute of the video, you'll learn why. The patient complained of mild pain, swelling, and numbness at the bite site. We hmm. knew that more than the local changes at the bite site, we had to keep an eye on the systemic effects of the toxins. Yeah. Initial systemic signs are... Oh, man. So, it I apparently can result in watered-down grape juice issuing from the patient's beard. Uh, yeah. Very, very severe side effects there. Uh, <laughs> Trappy says, if you ever get bit by a snake, just bite the snake back. Gotta show dominance. And that is your Chappy Jenkins advice for the day. <laughs> I appreciate you, Trappy. Uh, <laughs> uh, good stuff. Yeah. And check the redeems. Um, yes, I will do the red tailed hawk in a few minutes for Victorious there. Deepest blue dragon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the hydrate. Yeah. Signs are nausea. Yeah. Vomiting How you doing, Trappy? It's good to have you here. But the most feared complication of sea snake's bite is the neurotoxicity. Oh. The nerves meet muscles at neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine released by the nerve ends binds to the receptors at the muscle membranes to initiate contraction. Hmm. The sea snake toxins bind to these exact receptors. Ooh, this they block them? Muscle paralysis. Ah. Uh, muscle interesting. paralysis begins with eye I muscles. did not know that. Drooping of eyelids or ptosis and double vision or diplopia are the resulting symptoms. Huh. Then the muscle paralysis descends to the throat muscles, resulting in difficulty in swallowing and difficulty in speech. Interesting. Generalized muscle weakness is a late symptom. If the respiratory muscles are paralyzed, the patient can develop fatal respiratory failure. Oof. And that's the worst kind of respiratory fatal. Respiratory failure is the fatal kind. You know? Um laughing about this. Great yeah. Systemic effects of sea snake toxins include uh. direct muscle toxicity, rhabdomyolysis, renal failure, and coagulopathy. Renal failure, that's failure of the kidneys, correct? I assume these are kidneys and not livers, because usually people only have 
one liver. Yeah. Whereas they have two kidneys. You know, and again, I'm not some... I, I am not some big city mathematician. But uh, I, I think I think I know that, yes. Um, although that being said, my... I, I kid you not, my girlfriend in college had three kidneys. And she wasn't making that up. I also heard the same thing from her mother, who is a physician. Yeah, she was born with three kidneys. Um, which is kind of nuts. Your sister has four kidneys. Interesting, Truckhorn. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. And Tactile was saying that they work... Tactile, that's that's the chat message I was looking for earlier. The blue-ringed octopus is also an extraordinarily venomous animal. Maybe we'll look at a video about that next, Tactile. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very cool. In Deepest Blue, I will see you next time. Thank you for being here, Deepest Blue. Uh, appreciate you. Yeah. You had an aunt who had 2.5 kidneys? Well, maybe, actually... Maybe she had more like 2.5 kidneys, because the third kidney was a lot smaller than the other two, apparently. But yeah. <laughs> Dr. Java sources. Rich people here, many kidneys to sell. <laughs> well. To be fair, she did come from, I don't know if I'd say a wealthy background, but her family was definitely like upper middle class. Both of her parents were PhDs, and... Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, yeah. Let's continue this, and then maybe we'll watch a video on the Blue Ring Octopus because apparently tactile 3D pictures works on Blue Ring Octopus, which is that is an extraordinarily venomous animal, if I remember correctly. We observed yeah. the patient for the signs. Thankfully, he did not develop any of the systemic signs. So, why didn't we give the antivenom? Antivenoms for snake bites are highly allergenic. Sometimes uh, they can cause anaphylaxis, a oof. threatening allergic reaction. Yeah, Since so. our fisherman didn't develop systemic toxicity, we were able to monitor him without administering the antivenom. Alright, so what happened to the snake? Most sea snakes are seen in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Okay. All sea snakes are poisonous and have paddle-like tails. Oh, and why are they making it swim like this? They, they're they not mammals. It's not a whale. It's not a dolphin. It's not going... A vertical undulation like that. Sea snakes, like pretty much all reptiles, have horizontal undulation. They go from side to side like this. And just so you can tell that I'm not making this up, let me show you. Yeah... So just like all marine reptiles, as far as I know, these critters swim from side to side like this. Like that. That's why they have flattened tails. Tails that are flattened from side to side. Because they're sculling horizontally like that. You see that? Yeah. There you go. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, to make them go up and down is like, I don't know, it's exactly wrong. They're beautiful animals, they're so cool. Man, these are cool critters. So anyway, um... Alright, so what happened to the snake? Most sea snakes are seen in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Yeah. Sea snakes are poisonous and have paddle-like tails. And, yeah, maybe I'm being too hard on them, Dr. Terra. It is easier to animate them going like this, I suppose, if you have them in profile like that. Yeah. The presence of scales and lack of fins and gills help to differentiate coral reef snakes from eels. Mm. The subject of our story happened to be a yellow-bellied sea snake. Ah. Thanks to the subfamily Hydrophiidae, which is the most common sea snake family. The other huh. subfamily is Laticodinae. Interesting. Let's look those up real quick, actually. Because why not? Uh, Laticodinae. There we go. 
I guess that must be the other family of sea snakes from the beaked sea snake. There you go. Laticodonae right there. Includes the Chinese sea snake, the colubrine sea crate, the black banded sea crate, and this critter which doesn't even have a common name, apparently. Yeah. But uh, our yellow-bellied... No, that's, that's actually the critter's common name and not an insult. You yellow-bellied sea snake. There we go. Hydrophus is the genus. They are right there. Hydrophus platurus. Platurus, I think, means what? Flat-tailed? Platurus? Flat something. Flat means flat. In, uh, in Latin or Greek or Latinized Greek or Grecian Latin. Who knows? But anyway, hydro also means water. This means water snake, flat something. Uh, the yellow-bellied sea snake. Yeah. Uh, beautiful critter. They're really pretty. But, uh... Yeah. Anywho, cool stuff. The sea snake... Crates! There you go, Gogonek, yeah. But after a while, our friend started to move. We consulted zoologists and released the snake back to the ocean according to their instructions. Excellent. We were able to save Happy ending. Lives that day. Interesting, right? Yeah, it is interesting. To Tiny Medicine, the world's uh, most interesting medical YouTube channel. You know what? I haven't seen any other medical YouTube channels that talk about sea snakes, so I'll take your word for it. It does seem like the most interesting so far. Anyway, good stuff. Good stuff. Extraordinary group of animals that have ever appeared on this planet. Oh, uh, who? Yeah, Neo Keanu, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. Did you know that your name means New Keanu in Latin? Monsters. We came here to find fossils. And that's true. Here I go, 8 9. And here you are. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Great to have you here. Um, if anybody's just tuning in, like you two might be, welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. We're talking about, well, we were going to be talking about dinosaurs, but we are way far afield right now talking about lots of other critters that we share our planet worth, with, worth. Um, yeah. All life on Earth, we think, comes from a single common ancestor. And we can see that here on our grand tree of life. Let's zoom out from our yellow-bellied sea snake. We'll go out to all life. There's many, many lines of evidence that lead to this same conclusion. Molecular evidence, DNA, fossil evidence. The next time you're, you know, out in uh, Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco and, uh, you know, you see a, a hippie guy and he goes, hey, man, hey, hey, man, you know, all life on Earth is one, man. You know, biologically speaking, he's not wrong. As far as we know, all life on Earth derived from one single common ancestor about 3.8 billion years ago, something like that, give or take. That's why all living things share characteristics like, you know, DNA. So yeah, yeah. Cool stuff. Everything from ladybug beetles, bacteria, quinoa, whatever fungus this is. Not familiar with that. Octopus, buntings, elf cup, mushrooms, and kelp. You know, yeah. All the way down to us. Good old Homer Sapiens. Yeah, way over here. Yeah. Uh, it's one small step for a hominid, one giant leap for the study of biodiversity and common descent. So yeah, yeah. 
you don't want to share an ancestor with lima beans? I'm sorry, Adosia, but you also share a common ancestor with dinosaurs. Does that make up for it, Adosia? You might not like lima beans very much, but everybody loves, you know, Diplodocus and Ankylosaurus and Tyrannosaurus. Okay, fine, I guess, says Adoji. It's a good answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> and uh, Snowfall, this is not the Tetris theme. This is a classic Russian folk song called Korobanyeki. And uh, it's also the Tetris theme. You're, you're right, Snowfall. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Indrax says, I am Quinoa. Well, shoot, let's go look at Quinoa real quick. Um, quinoa. It's going to be quite the journey to get from humans to Quinoa, but we're still there on the same tree, you know? And there we go. Good song for uh, Tree of Life journeys here. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty far down in there. This must be a very diverse group. Quinoa! Very nice. And Gimplex says the mosquito. Let's look for a cold weather mosquito. And let's play that song over again, because I really like it. Yeah. Cold... All right, whatever. A cold weather mosquito isn't coming up. I know that's a common name for a critter. But let's look for... This looks pleasant. The African malaria mosquito. That sounds like a pleasant fellow. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. And the show The Last of Us got me scared of fungus now. Interesting, here I go. Yeah, wasn't there an X-Files episode with some scary fungus, too? I want to say there was. Um, but yeah, there we go. Man, this is a diverse group. It just keeps going and going. And there you go, the Africa, African malaria mosquito. Oh, you... Honestly, this is probably the deadliest animal in Africa. Forget lions, forget leopards, forget hippos and Cape buffalo. The African malaria mosquito has probably killed more human beings than any other animal on that continent. Yeah. Uh, it's basically our cousin, our very, very distant cousin, Gimpleg. But unfortunately, it is always visiting and wanting to stay with us. Yeah, I don't know. It's just that relative who will not go away. Um, let's jump from that to, uh... Let's go to, uh... Oh, let's go to the Blue Ringed Octopus. That's what we're gonna do. Yeah. Uh, probably the lesser Blue Ringed Octopus, I'm guessing. Is the critter that Tactile 3D Pictures worked with. Um... Yeah. But they're definitely from your dad's side of the family. You think so, Gimpleg? I don't know. I think your dad is probably a homo sapiens like the rest of us, Gimpleg. But I don't know. Anyway, here we go. The lesser blue ringed octopus. Let's see if we can find a video about these remarkable cephalopods. We were watching some cephalopod videos yesterday. Uh, blue ringed octopus venom. Let's have ourselves a look at that. And maybe let's unmute it here. There we go. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at this from Deadly Fur. octopus is more yeah. venomous than any terrestrial or land-dwelling animal. And they live in shallow okay. waters of the Pacific Ocean, primarily as bottom-dwellers. 
They can be okay. found along the coasts of Australia, Japan, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka. Although huh. that may sound like a broad area, because they only live in shallow, temperate waters, their habitat range is rather small. They're non-aggressive in opposition to their stigma and are usually found hiding in crevices, empty seashells, and even thrown out bottles and cans. Huh. If you were aware of their existence before stumbling into this episode, you may yep. be surprised to learn that they are actually extremely small. I didn't the realize they were that small. Will only that's correct. A few yeah. Inches in length, and that's including. Hey, Dark their native, how you doing? Most Welcome back. Of them are about the Great size to see of a golf ball, and that's once they reach adulthood. Blue ringed octopuses eat crustaceans and the occasional small fish. They hmm. hunt by enveloping their prey, disallowing them to escape, and puncturing a small hole into their shell. Oof. Then they just kind of drool everywhere. So they secrete Their saliva. saliva. Is toxic, so yeah. it ends up paralyzing the prey. Very cool. Blue ring octopuses actually have two different sets. Shaco, do you too, Dark One Native? Thank you for feeding, being feeding, just as I described, uh. and another used for defense. The toxin released for defense, that's the scary one. Well, I guess for those crustaceans, they're probably both <laughs> pretty scary. Agreed, yeah. The venom itself yeah. is actually made via a symbiotic relationship between the octopus and a bacteria in its mouth. Adult blue ring octopuses lack the ability to ink as a means of defense, so they only have their venom on which to rely. Interesting. Well, that and those crazy blue... That does make me wonder... Which of those came first? Did they lose the ability to ink first, or did they, did they develop the toxicity first? Yeah, these are the kinds of questions that a paleontologist would ask, you know? Yeah. Rings. A blue-ringed octopus will only display its rings when threatened. They use these as a sign to ward off potential predators, as if saying, Hey, I could probably kill you. And they can flash these rings in a third of... Was that a white tip nurse shark? Or a white tip reef shark? Excuse me. Or oceanic white tip? What? It, what? It, this looks more like a reef shark. It looks like a white tip reef shark. But uh, any shark aficionados here in chat? Anybody who knows their sharks? Uh, and Dinosaur Dave says, Dinosaur Dave, who comes from Straya, says that we were told to avoid them as kids down here. Yeah, I would also avoid uh, blue ringed octopus as adults too. That and cone snails and stonefish and box jellyfish and so many other things. Yeah, saltwater crocodiles, probably freshwater crocodiles too, cassowaries, um, bird-eating spiders, all those other spiders that you have, the ones that hide inside of shoes. Um, you you got a lot of cool critters down there, Dinosaur Dave. You really do down in Australia. Yeah. Uh, and it is a white tip reef shark. Thank you, Murph. Yeah. Hey, I could nice. probably kill you. And they can flash these rings. Hey, Britt, how are you doing, Creatrix Britt? Welcome, welcome. So, this fast. Oh. Or this fast. Like this. The reason they can perform this action so fast is because when the rings are not visible, they're actually simply being hidden under folds of the octopus's skin. Yeah, those when are chromatophores. Wants to reveal right? its rings, it only has to uncover them. Although it's not been determined how long young octopuses live before they mature. <laughs> Once they have matured and are ready to mate, their fate has basically been sealed, as the mating process kills both parents. There you involved. go, Smay, yeah. Female blue ring octopus. Bird eating spiders, spider eating birds, like the cassowaries. Cassowaries eat spiders, lots of birds eat spiders. Bird eating birds, spider eating spiders. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's good advice overall, Smay. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um,. And spiders hiding in shoes, I feel, is a universal terror. You know, Snowfall, when I am out in the field digging up dinosaurs, whether it's in Montana or Wyoming or Utah or Nevada or wherever, uh, I usually keep my boots outside of my tent. And every morning, little ritual, when I'm unzipping, you know, the door of my tent, pick up the boots, turn them upside down, clap them against each other like that, and then you put them on. Because you never know who might be hiding in there. You know, it's... It's just common sense, you know? Yeah. You don't want to wake up to a blue ringed octopus. Do you think dinosaurs are put together correctly? The bones. <laughs> You're smart. What do you think? You do a research I, on that, I, Oliver. I, I never. <laughs> Hawkmoon99, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. There you go. Yeah. 
The procedure yeah. will remain with her eggs, protecting them until they hatch. This yeah. can last anywhere from a month to a few months, depending on the species. During this time, the female blue ring octopus won't eat. Shortly after her yeah. babies have hatched, That's she'll like, die. This I think is almost all octopus are like most that. Octopus species. Yeah, so yeah. The lifespan of a blue ring octopus is a short one, which Aww. is what makes this next point all the more confusing. Hmm. Blue ring octopuses are actually kept as pets. Yeah. And yes, even though they live extremely short lives, and yes, even though they are highly deadly, they. I mean, nobody's going to eat them, right? Well, I don't know. Shoot. Maybe there is some kind of sushi that's made from, you know, only using parts of the octopus that are not toxic or something. I don't know. I don't understand sushi like that. But, um,. Yeah, anyway, I think most people who own blue ring octopus as pets would be doing so because, A, they're pretty common. They're small. They're fairly easy to take care of as far as cephalopods go. And uh, and they don't they don't last all that long either. I remember my crew chief um, years ago saying that he really liked the idea of keeping an octopus as a pet. Because as a paleontologist like me, he would spend three or four months maybe out of every year in the field. If you have a pet that... Well... I don't know. I'll show you another example of a pet that would... Uh... Man, this was a huge trend for a while. Uh... Yeah... Uh, some of you might remember this. I'm dating myself here. But here is a kind of pet that would not last for very long. And, uh... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. This is... If you're a, a, a paleontologist and you go out and you spend, you know, several months of every year, every summer, out in the field, digging up fossils, maybe the, this is the kind of pet for you. You know? Um... Yeah, have a gander here. There's a new pet. Ch -ch -ch Chia. Chia pet. The pottery <laughs> that grows. It's fun and easy. Soak your chia, spread the seeds, keep it watered, and watch it grow. And now grow a whole collection of fun with Chia teddy bears. Puppies, kittens, rams, bulls. There's even a Chia tree. To keep a tree? Pet. Wow. Chia pets and trees. The pottery that grows. Oh, there, there is some kind of a... Oh, man. If I were a philosopher, I would probably remember the name for this. But there is a name for a thing that... Uh, shoot. It, it, there's like a weird facsimile of a thing that's a facsimile of another thing. So you could grow a regular tree, or you could buy this, like, product that is supposed to artificially mimic a tree like that, and it... Like, it has been superficially, you know, constructed to resemble the original thing that it's based off of. I don't remember what it's called, but um, there's like a philosophical concept about that. Um, and there is a Bob Ross Chia Pet, too, Odie Lavender. I had a dinosaur Chia Pet. Uh, yeah... And now, Bob Ross Chia Pet. Watch it grow. Fantastic. At Chia.com. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Uh, does anybody else remember these? Simulacrum, There, I think that might be part of it. It's like a something-something simulacrum. It's not the ship of Theseus, Moonrise Rabbit, but I like where you're headed with that. A little bit different. Yeah... Uh, something, something simulacrum. Um, but yeah, yeah. But you put an air plant in the head and see, a doja, a doja is thinking smarter, not harder there. A doja, that, that's the way to do it. An air plant will last a lot longer than a chia pet. Um, I had one that was supposed to look like a sauropod dinosaur. And it didn't work very well. Apparently, you can get. There's a new pet. Oh boy. Chia pet, the pottery that grows. And and now. 
Introducing Chia Pet Jurassic World. Oh no. Featuring Marvel's Spider Man. Yeah. And Disney's Kermit. It's fun. Spread the seeds. Water. Watch it grow. Uh, oh, goodness. Anyway, yeah. Um, I wish they could have actually put like a real, you know, a, an authentic dinosaur tax on there. Not a made up Indominus Rex. Not even a real dinosaur. Gah. Anyway. Chia Pet Baby Yoda. No Homer Simpson. I don't know, wrote Dan. There probably was a Homer one too. I didn't realize these were still around. Apparently it's a 2015 Chia Pet commercial. Yeah. Anyway, I cannot give you an endorsement for this at all. I had a Chia Pet for a while. I had the dinosaur one. I took very good care of it. And the thing that happens when you do that is that those seeds, it was this one here, those seeds, you know, start to grow and it just gets really, really long and then it goes and it can no longer support its weight. And it, it, it basically like collapses like that. Um, and it dies. These are the better care you take of it, the worse it goes. It seems that was my impression. Anywho. So yeah, yeah. And ugh, Indominus Rex. Ugh, ugh. Curse you, Jurassic World. Got an opportunity to show people some cool new dinosaurs, feathered dinosaurs. And they're like, nope. We're just gonna make up some fictional dinosaurs instead, and we're gonna confuse the public. So anyway, yeah. Uh, you gotta prune your chia pet? I tried that, and it killed it, Snowfall. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. And Lenina, ew, indeed, yes. Lenina, upon seeing our, uh, Indomin Indominus Rex chia pet, gave a hearty, uh... Ew. Yeah. <laughs> One more time. Yeah, deserved. Very much deserved. <laughs> uh, do they do they make you cheerful? No, I it made me sad. Uh, Vigilanta, welcome back. By the way, it's good to see you. But no, I, I I took very good care of my chia pet, and that only killed it faster. You know. So yeah, like a bonsai tree. No, a bonsai tree requires patience. And like, the more work you put into it, the more you get out of it. A chia pet is like, I don't know, you water it more and it grows really big and then it collapses under its own weight and it dies. So I don't know, yeah. Emodium Rex. <laughs> there you go, Gojira, yeah, yeah. And Dr. Terra, I don't even know. I, I happened to watch that trailer the other day, and it was just... It just made me sad. I don't think I'm going to watch it here on stream, Dr. Terra. Sorry. But yeah. Yeah. A depressing life lesson. There you go, Adosha. Yeah. Yeah. And Jody Fish says, like a devil's snare, the more you fight it, the faster it kills you. Yeah, what? That's... I feel like that's false advertising, too. Shouldn't a devil snare be used to catch devils? Yeah, you know? Yeah. It's a Harry Potter thing. Oh, okay. I guess it doesn't know what... Yeah. I didn't know there were devils in Harry Potter. Huh. Um. Anywho. Shows what I know. Uh... Let's get back to... Oh, we got to do a dinosaur deep dive here. Uh, Victarius has requested a particular dinosaur. And let me see if I can pull that up. In fact, I think I might have an interesting angle on this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um... 
let's see. How has nobody made a video about this yet? Um... There's got to be a video about this, right? Um... Come on now. How did Vox never make a video about this? That's- this is right up their alley. This is their... Uh... And you have a good night, too, Tactile. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Let's see. Um... Let's see. Well, here we go. First of all, let me make sure that I'm... Let's see. Sergeant Raccoon, thank you for the raid. Sergeant Welcome. Cisco Raccoon 1483 has arrived with two raiders. Welcome to the party here. Great to have you here, Sergeant Raccoon. Thank you for your raid. How are you doing? Great to see you. How'd your stream go? Yeah. And, yep, I did have this right. Excellent. So... Uh, many of you have probably seen clips from TV shows, commercials, movies. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. You have probably... Heard this sound many, many times over. And especially if you are here in the United States. If you're American. You probably associate that piercing cry with a bald eagle. Like you see right here. Symbol of the United States. That sound is a lie. Bald eagles don't make that noise. Let's talk about that. Bald Eagle, a mighty symbol with a not so mighty voice. And you know what? Let's let's go ahead and listen to this real quick, shall we? Bird expert Connie Stanger blames Hollywood. You know the scene. You've got John Wayne riding through the sunset, and you'd hear the jingle of spurs, and often that piercing, loud cry. A cry that's synonymous with America's national bird. But there's a problem, says Stanger, who works at the World Center for Birds of Prey in Boise. Yep. If you were to look up at the bird making that sound in real life, you wouldn't see a bald eagle. They no. They jump over it with a red-tailed hawk's cry. And the reason? Mm -hmm. Well, take a listen to what the bald eagle actually sounds like. <laughs> Unfortunately for the bald eagle, it has like a little cackling type of a laugh. That's not really very impressive for the bird. Stanger says one other yeah. thing you might not know about the bird that symbolizes American strength. Most of the images you see are of the female of the species, which are bigger than the males. I'm yeah. Jessica Robinson reporting. That's and true I'm of thinking. most birds of prey, actually. Yeah, is the females are larger than the males. Um, here, let's have a comparison between a red-tailed hawk and a bald eagle here. Of course, our dinosaur deep dive is on the red-tailed hawk here. Thank you, Victarius, for suggesting this. That's excellent. Um, but yeah, you know, here's here's a bit of info that you can uh, you can tell your friends. Um, if you'd like to feel smug about this kind of thing, because I know many people on the internet enjoy feeling smug about things. The next time you're watching a commercial or a movie or 
shoot even some documentaries will show footage of a bald eagle and they'll have that sound that red-tailed hawk sound there and you could say that's not a red that's not a bald eagle that's a red-tailed hawk um have a look and a listen yeah red-tailed hawk and bald eagle there you go Yep. <laughs> yeah. And not the internet exactly, Creature Expert, right? <laughs> oh, boy. Are we going to have more, or is it... Is this it? And that was it. Okay. Yeah. And there we go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is what I was looking for. Throughout North and Central America. Red-tailed hawks. Don't live anywhere near their native range. They're probably familiar to you. Yeah. Why in just a bit. And uh Holy cow. Raiders came here to experience poultry in motion. Uh, Schoolie, thank you so much for the raid and welcome to Paleontologizing. You might say. I don't know why that didn't show up in my activity feed. But welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? And it's therefore likely that we're here today because yeah. by the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary true. times got felled in a mass extinction. Baba Giaga, thank you for the follow. The Judge BQ, thanks for following. And thank you for clicking that follow button there. Anaximandros. Anaximandros, welcome to the channel. There you go. Uh, Siddhartha92, thank you for following. And thank you, FIBA. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Holy cow, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. Uh, Grieger, thank you for the follow. Kozer Maru. How you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. Holy moly. Uh, thank you for following. Right now, the dinosaurs rule. Uh, how was your stream... Raiders, I hope it was really excellent. Look at all those chickens. Look at all those chickens. As we now know, birds themselves are living dinosaurs. Uh, I've got a fossil, or a 3D printed, Archaeopteryx right there that helps kind of illustrate the dinosaur bird link. I can show you that later if you'd like to see it. But welcome, welcome. Android, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. And Victarius, thank you for gifting, Skuliki, HS... Thank you, Victorious. Skuliki, how did your stream go? I hope it was really, really good. Welcome to Paleontologizing, everybody. And Victarious. Oh, Books, Brews, and Booze. Thank you, Books, for the eight months of support. And thank you, Victarious, for those two gift subs there. Beautiful. We've got a bunch of cool new people here, it seems, who came in here with uh, Skuliki. I think it might be about time to play a quick welcome video to introduce some new folks to the channel, to tell you what paleontologizing is all about, why a paleontologist is here on Twitch in the first place. You know, what would a fossil scientist want to do here on Twitch? Well, yeah. This will not be the same welcome video that we watched earlier. This will be a different one. So stay tuned and... Hold your horses there. Patience. Previously recorded Danny, a uh, good friend of the channel here, is sneaking up behind me right now, and uh, he's raring to go. He would love to tell you about, you know, how this channel came to be, what a paleontologist is doing here on the Twitch platform, all that good stuff. And get just a second, okay? Holy cow. Um... He wants to tell you all about it, so I'm going to go ahead and let him take center stage here. So without further ado, here comes a quick welcome video with previously recorded Danny. Take it away! Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then uh, welcome to paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, 
Where's the video game? Well, my name's Danny Anduza, and I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs. But how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell you. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. In my first week there, I started working in the Paleo Lab at Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you are more familiar with that institution and with my old boss than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler, who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of field work digging at hundreds of sites in the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. In 2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Chasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen, the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy, Trurarcuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, and some others on behavioral functional morphology, basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs, but I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana. So I packed up and moved back to the West Coast. And I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I've moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better, too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things, like Velociraptor's jump or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids want to see them lining up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. 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 Having made the jump to teaching remotely, it was only a short leap from there to Twitch. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. 
Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. And uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Skuliki. Well, that incredible raid, really appreciate that. Welcome, welcome to the channel. Uh, appreciate you, Skuliki, and I hope you had a wonderful stream. And, uh... Siddhartha, this is pretty cool stuff. Thank you, Siddhartha. I appreciate that. Still mind-boggling to me that these creatures once from the Earth? Not just that they once did. I'll let you in on a little secret, Siddhartha. Are you ready? So here's the thing. A little bit closer. A little secret here? Dinosaurs are still around. They never went completely extinct. And no, this is not me. This is not some like wild conspiracy theory or something like that. Ask any paleontologist, ask any evolutionary biologist, any ornithologist, any bird scientist. They'll tell you the same thing. Dinosaurs never went completely extinct. Birds are living dinosaurs. And we still have them here today. Somebody type in exclamation mark turkey into chat and uh, pull up a little infographic there. I put this together uh, before last Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving of, not last, Thanksgiving of 2021, I believe. There we go, yeah. Um. Your Thanksgiving turkey, or your Christmas turkey, or your Boxing Day budgie, or whatever birds people eat. It's so weird that people eat birds. Anyway, your turkey is a dinosaur, as are all birds. Birds are living dinosaurs. They evolved from two-legged, meat-eating, hollow-boned, feathered dinosaurs. This is a skeleton of Velociraptor right here on the right, and Meliagris gallopavo, the domestic turkey, there on the left. I, you know, they're so similar. I had to I had to point out which one was which. <laughs> but all jokes aside, they share so many different skeletal characteristics, and that's because they both descend from the same ancestor. Well, we today we've got literally hundreds, thousands of specimens of feathered dinosaurs. And we've started to be able to kind of piece together, it's still a little bit tricky, but we've started to be able to piece together the origins of birds from their dinosaur ancestors, you know? So yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Mayor of Space has just discovered a new command there. I made the Thursday Birds Day command. Congratulations, Mayor of Space, putting that together. Yeah, or discovering that. Very nice. So yeah, yeah. Your mom is a dinosaur. Boom. Says Pro Scient. I mean, if you're a bird, then your mom is a dinosaur. Sure. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Before we got this excellent raid, uh, we were talking about a particular living dinosaur today, the red-tailed hawk. So let's get back into that real quick. And let's go ahead and complete this dinosaur deep dive here. Uh, check it out. Red-tailed hawks live throughout North and Central America. And even yep. if you don't live anywhere near their native range, they're probably familiar to you. We'll yeah. We'll in just a bit. Ooh. The, again, I want to emphasize that. No matter where you live in the world, you'll be a little bit familiar with this bird, even if you've never heard of a red-tailed hawk before. Buteo jamaicensis is the, the Latin name for this critter, the scientific binomial. 
you will have heard this if you're this sort of person. If you're here on Twitch, you probably have seen movies and television shows before. You, you're probably familiar with this critter. Red-tailed hawks are frequently seen sitting atop a prominent tree within their ranges. But yeah. They also happily utilize man-made perches like fence posts and telephone mm -hmm. poles. They may also oh, be yeah. seen soaring high above the ground in circling patterns. <coughs> um. While perching or soaring, these birds are in search of their next meals. Red-tailed hawks eat small mammals such as voles, prairie dogs, and rabbits. But they've yeah. also been observed eating snakes, other birds, and carrion. Heck, there's even an account of a red-tailed hawk picking up a domestic cat. The cat Oof. was free, however, and survived. Good cats for the cat. Red-tailed hawks may come into contact. Because Keep your cats indoors, people. If you don't want dinosaurs to eat them, or if you don't want them to eat dinosaurs, that's actually much more likely. Is that your your cat will be out there just murdering birds left and right? But. There are big birds out there that would love to eat your cat, so keep your cat indoors. Anyway. Because these birds have been able to adjust to living alongside humans. Yeah. Red-tailed hawks live in nearly any environment, though they aren't found in tundra regions or in dense forests. Mm. These birds of prey come in a wide range of patterns and colors, which can make them a challenge to identify. One of the only guaranteed ways to tell if a hawk-like bird is in fact a red-tailed hawk is to check out the leading edges of its wings in flight. Ah, oh, this is going to be interesting. Because we have a number of hawk species here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and I don't, I'm not good at, at differentiating them. I'm, I'm lousy at that. Uh, I'm a, a straight up feral noob when it comes to, uh, to bird, uh, bird of prey identification. If it's not, a falcon or a merlin or a vulture? I probably don't know what it is. Um, but yeah. Vigilanta, in reference to cats, says, Mine has a catio, an enclosed cat patio. I'm familiar with catios, Vigilanta. So he can look but not touch. That's awesome, Vigilanta. That's very cool. What a lucky cat. Holy cow, Vigilanta. You're a, you're a, a top tier, S tier cat owner. Holy cow, Vigilanta. Yeah. And Mayor Space says, if you keep your cat indoors, keep your toilet lid down, they will catch sicknesses drinking out of that. Interesting, Mayor Space. I always put the toilet seat down, you know? Uh, except when I'm using it, obviously. But yeah, yeah. And uh, he has a water fountain, too. That's very nice, Vigilanta, yeah. Um, and I agree, books, brews, and booze. In our world we live in today, it's simply not safe to have animals wander outside by themselves anymore. Not pets. Yeah. Don't... Yeah, I don't know. I... Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, most people are generally respectful of animals, but... I've seen some horrible things that people have done to animals. Domestic animals around here. Not to mention, you know, coyotes or cars, what they could do to a cat. Keep your cats indoors, people. It's common sense. Anyway, let's continue. You don't want a red-tailed hawk carrying off your cat, or any other kind of hawk, for that matter. Um, yeah. In fact, a red-tailed hawk is to check out the leading edges of its wings in flight. Ooh, how do I identify them? Red-tailed hawks have dark patches in this area. And it oh. might seem like an obvious mark to look for in red-tailed hawks would be a, well, red tail. But Ooh, no. Red hawks yeah. don't have red tails. Huh. Juvenile red-tailed hawks have banded tails. There's some ontogeny there. For up to two years before they grow the adult red-colored feathers. Interesting. So it's not a dependable field mark, though huh. it can definitely help. Some ontogeny. other signs to look for ontogeny. are ontogeny. yellow feet yeah. and legs. A curved and pointed beak that turns yellow at the base. Huh. The beak should look like it fits the hawk's face, unlike eagle beaks, which be chonkin'. Interesting. I wonder about... So I... And Zers 2. Xerxes 2. Thank you for the raid. Thank you, Xerxes, for the raid. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Ontogeny. Yeah. So I and my students actually encountered a red-shouldered hawk 
back in, this would have been June of 2020. Let me see if I can find that. Unfortunately, this hawk was dead. Um, I ended up calling the local raptor center, and they made some phone calls, and, um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, they think that this hawk ingested, they think that it caught a rat or a vole or a mouse that had been poisoned. So another reason not to put rat poison out. But here is a dead red-shouldered hawk. Not a red-tailed hawk, but a red-shouldered hawk. That I found on the ground. That beak. Yeah. This was in the Presidio in San Francisco. Um, yeah, poor critter. That's not a good death, too. That's not a good way to die. Dying from rat poison. Ugh. There's a beetle that we found later that day, and some more plants and stuff, but I think going forward, there's a moth. Yep. Here was somebody from San Francisco's Presidio who came to collect this bird to do a biopsy on it. Uh, or necropsy. To figure out what went wrong with it. But yeah. So anyway, don't if you have any choice in the matter, if you have any alternatives, don't use rat poison. I, I have a friend whose dog died from eating rat poison that his neighbors put out. So, rat poison is just a... It's an awful, awful thing. I don't know. I also know a friend who almost, like, had to have his stomach pumped when he was a toddler because he ingested rat poison. Uh, and he could have died if he didn't live right near a hospital. Um, rat poison's a horrible, horrible thing. I don't know why it's allowed, honestly. Um, but yeah, yeah. Ladina says, we had a cat almost die from rat poison. We rushed him to the vet just in time. So sorry you... I, I'm so sorry that happened, but I'm really glad that, that you were able to, to make haste there, Lenina, and make sure your cat didn't die from that. Yeah. Yeah. And Paper Cut says, I live on old farmland, and we had mice. I would trap them and take them on a field trip. Paper Cuts, that's my style, too. Earlier on stream today, there was a moth that flew into here, and I was able to grab it, and I went and took it outside. You know, it, if you can embrace your your inner kindness and humanity and give, give critters a second chance and not just kill them because you're like, I don't know. I, I think that's always preferable. You know? Preserve your humanity. Be kind to other critters. It's just common courtesy. You know? Yeah. And your sister worked for a vet, so she recognized it immediately? Oh, Lenina, that is... That's a harrowing story. My goodness. And you have the spider glass for trapping spiders and taking them to the shed. I like that, Vigilanta. I like that a lot. In fact, I need to I need to make sure I've got a designated spider slash scorpion catcher for when I do field work this coming summer. Um uh Yeah, I gotta make sure I have that in my tent so I can capture and re-release various critters like that. Hmm. Yeah. And Paper Cuts is not a fan of handling any dead thing, even fossils, Paper Cuts? Even fossils? I assume you don't mean fossils. I'm I'm being I'm being difficult. I'm sorry, Paper Cuts. But yeah. Yeah. And Hexrow says mosquitoes accepted a figure if you're dining on me, your fair game. Hexrow, I agree with that. I will bite mosquitoes right back. The the problem is my bites are fatal to a mosquito. So yeah. Um, and yep, yeah, traps, rat traps. There you go, Mayor Space. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Maximum Darnish says we keep rodents away by adopting stray cats. We converted our patio into a cat home, one hundred percent effective. You can't argue with those numbers, Maximum Darnish. Very nice. Yeah, a mosquito's bite can be fatal to you too. 
Not if I bite it first, Mayor Space. I don't know. I've got bigger teeth. Yeah. And pizza time, says Trappy Jenkins. I usually don't put mosquitoes on my pizza, Trappy. But, um... But, you know, to each their own, I suppose. And thank you for the hydrate there, Art Young Might. I just, during our welcome video, I refilled my water... Measuring cup with ice and with liquid water, too. Uh, oh, and Victorious. There's enough mice on our farmland to lure the red tails back this spring. Very nice, Victorious. Victorious, already thinking ahead to Thursday, Birds Day, which is only two days away here. Here. Um, there you go. Mayor of Space says they have West Nile virus and Zika. Well, shoot, Mayor of Space. I happen to be a vector of what is... It's a... It's not that rare of a condition. But I've heard it referred to as dinomania. Apparently I have some sort of a terminal case. Uh, sometimes it advances to a stage in which the vector becomes a, a dinosaur paleontologist. Uh, but it is fatal to mosquitoes if they are bitten by somebody uh, who has this condition. So anyway, yeah. You get any bird pics? You've got a few days, Lenina. You've got a few days. Holy cow. Yeah. Um. Anyway, excuse me. Back to our red-tailed hawks, you know? Vigilantes says armadillos carry leprosy, too. Yeah, don't... Try not to get bitten by, le by arm any armadillos and try not to bite them, either. You don't want to have to go live at a leper colony. Uh, like in that Weird Al Yankovic song. Yeah, never eat an armadillo. <laughs> yeah, although... <laughs> I understand, Mayor of Space. There was a time... There was a time, apparently, during the Great Depression, that some people would it, here in these United States they would call they would uh, they would eat armadillos, and they were called Hoover hogs. The armadillos, not the people. Hoover hog, noun, because impoverished people were reduced to and Hoover. This is uh, U.S. President Henry Hoover. Uh, arguably our greatest Republican president, uh, may have suggested that eating such animals during the Great Depression... Wait. Some people were reduced to eating armadillos during the Great Depression, uh, which Hoover presided over the start of. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hoover hog. Uh, armadillo. Yeah. Anyhow. Let them eat Hoover Hawks, says Billy Joe. <laughs> An armadillo in every pot. <laughs> oh, those poor critters. Yeah. You know, leprosy schmeprosy. Go eat those armadillos. Oh, boy. Yeah. Armad armadonto. There, there you go, books. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, do no armadillos. Yeah, Vigilanta. Also known as the Hippopotamus Oath. Yeah. Anyway, back to our, uh, our red-tailed hawks here. Red-tailed hawks also tend to have little white U or V shapes on the edges of their feathers. Huh. Which can be seen while the wings are folded up and the bird is perched. Very cool. Even if you've never seen one of these beauties, we can almost guarantee you've heard one. Probably the easiest way to tell there's a red-tailed hawk in the area is to listen for its call. Does this sound familiar? Yeah. If you haven't heard that or something similar, because that's the sound filmmakers use as sound clips for raptors in film, regardless yep. of the species. Female red-tailed hawks are... One more time. One more time. If you've ever heard this before in a movie, chances are it's been a bald eagle that's appeared there, but bald eagles don't actually make that noise. Does this sound familiar? 
We'd be yeah. surprised if you haven't heard that or something similar, because that's the sound filmmakers use as sound clips for raptors in film, regardless yep. of the species. Female red-tailed hawks are usually larger than males, though on average these birds weigh just over two pounds. They have wingspans of over four That's feet, heavy for a bird. Those large wings help them to perform some pretty amazing air stunts. During yeah. a mating dance, males will dive at a deep angle and then soar back up to catch a female's attention. If he wins her affections, then they may even lock talons and plunge to the earth, twirling around each other in a death-defying display. Very cool. A nest high in a tree <laughs> How romantic. Use the nest that they built the year prior. <laughs> For the most part, uh, hawks are monogamous. Hey, Selena Kyle, how you doing? Yeah, romantic indeed. Mate has died. The female does most of the incubation, and there are usually one to four eggs. The eggs take about 30 days to incubate, and the baby hawks will leave the nest after about 45 days, though they'll remain in their parents' <laughs> territory for at least a Vigilanta, month after there that. you go. On average, red-tailed hawks <laughs> don't make it to 10 years of age, though they've uh, been known to reach nearly 20. And captive red-tailed hawks have been documented to make it to 30. Wow. Facts on red -tailed hawks, check out That's the older than me. Give a Shoot. Up if you learn like all Twitch today, streamers, obviously, you, you know. Animal fact files. I happen to be 21 and single, as all Twitch streamers are. There's a link to that video there if you'd like to check it out. Thank you so much to Victarius for uh, suggesting that dinosaur deep dive there. Yes. Birds themselves are living dinosaurs, and that's... That's why you can submit a bird for a dinosaur deep dive. We've been getting a lot of birds lately. <laughs> and, and I appreciate that. I do. Yeah. And the heaviest raptor is the harpy eagle. This is true. I think that's true, Mayor Space, yeah. Holy cow, harpy eagles are nuts. We will... I am resisting the temptation right now to uh, to watch a video about harpy eagles because holy cow are they uh, are they neat critters? They're really really cool. Oh, anyway, yeah. Creatrix Brit says, "God, I wish being on Twitch made us 21." Shh, Creatrix Brit. It does. Okay. Don't don't blow up my spot, Creatrix Brit. <laughs> Um, but yeah. And why are you resisting? Because that's what I do, Selena Kyle. Somebody will, in fact, there's probably people watching right now who have enough channel points saved up that they can, uh, that they can redeem Harpy Eagle as a dinosaur deep dive. And somebody's going to do that at some point, and I will let them do so. But... Shoot, there were videos here that we were going to watch earlier that we've not gotten to yet, including this one right here. Let's check this out. Uh, I forget who this was who submitted this. But there is a pigeon right there engaging in what we call wing-assisted incline running. <laughs> ah, yeah, there you go. Running, running, running and flapping the wings to stay upright. That is beautiful. Oh man, I love that. Hang on, hang on. Let's let's start this over and let's turn the volume up because the laughter really makes it. That's that's good stuff. Here we go. Sounds like it's in Japan. This is Columba live, the African rock dove, now a cosmopolitan species. Yeah, wing assisted incline running. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> this one does the same thing. Shoot. But that one goes up. Okay, there you go. Good for you. Mr. or Ms. Pigeon there. Good for you. <laughs> that was good stuff. Um, 
Yeah. Here, let's see if we can find a video about... In fact, we have one right here. We have got a command for this. This is beautiful. Thank you, Lenina. This gets us into... Yeah, wing-assisted incline running here. Hoo-hoo-hoo, good stuff. Yeah. Hey, Steph, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Birds has long been a great scientific puzzle. So, birds themselves are living dinosaurs. Let's talk about that a little bit, and let's talk about how they evolved an ability that seems almost like a superpower. Flight. How do you evolve flight in the first place? It's such a crazy ability. Like, how do you even do that? Well, we as paleontologists have been trying to figure this out for a good while now. And, uh, check out this video. Yeah. Claire, thank you for making this command. Awesome stuff. Fossil evidence from the past 40 years has established that birds descended from theropods. Yep. A lineage of two-legged dinosaurs that included species with feathers on their bodies and arms. Like Sinoceropteryx there. Yeah. But those early animals could not fly. Uh-uh. So how did birds take flight? And what did I say here, everybody? What did I say? Somebody was going to redeem Harpy Eagle as a dinosaur deep dive, and Mayor of Space has done that. <laughs> So thank you, Mayor of Space. We will talk about Harpy Eagles in just a little bit. Yeah. And Snowfall has a very relevant question. Snowfall wants to know, at what point do feathered arms become wings? How can we judge if they had the appropriate, appropriate musculature or flight surface? This video talks about that, Snowfall. Quite a timely question. Here. Let's check it out, because that's what this is all about. Uh, continue. There's Ken Dial right there. A new hypothesis came from my studies of young birds that are learning to fly. Yeah. And it all started with a bale of hay. Yep. Again, in paleontology, of course, we we only use the most sophisticated and hard to come by and and extraordinarily expensive scientific equipment, you know? Things like, um, oyster knives and toothbrushes, bags of plaster, and in this case, bales of hay. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, not sometimes, let's be honest, most of the time, paleontology happens with, with very rudimentary equipment, you know? So, uh, feed scoops, there you go, Kennedy, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Here, let's, uh, let's continue. And St. Louis Mo, welcome back, St. Louis Mo, good to have you here. Uh, the St. Louis, uh... St. Louis finds and rehabs raptors and other large birds that are found virtually nationwide. That is super cool. Oh, these are birds that are hurt from hunters or others firing weapons and shot at them. Arrow wounds, gun wounds, etc. Ugh. Uh, they actually do use a treadmill to help them rehab. There you go, St. Louis Mill. We'll be talking about that. About stability flapping. Right here. Let's go back a titch. New hypothesis came from my studies of young birds that are learning to fly. Yeah. And it all started with a bale of hay. There you go. See the complex and sophisticated scientific equipment we use? <laughs> yeah. I've been studying the mechanics of bird flight for over three decades at the University of Montana's flight lab. Yeah. This is, by the way, the University of Montana, not Montana State University, which is where I went to, in Bozeman, Montana. Ken Dial is from the University of Montana, which is uh, which is up in Helena, Montana. And these two schools, it's pretty cute, actually. They think they have a fierce rivalry, but it's like, I don't know. Uh, 
yeah, anyway. University of Montana versus Montana State. Everybody outside of Montana is like, that's funny. But man, do, do MSU and U of M students take that seriously. It's pretty ridiculous. Um, but anyway, Ken Dial is a colleague and, uh, yeah, he's done some really, really cool work. Utmost respect to Dr. Ken Dial there. Yeah. I became interested in an intriguing question that critics of evolutionary theory had posed to Darwin. Ooh, critics. So there's a gentleman <laughs> by the name of Sir George Jackson Maivart. Mm. He challenged Charles Darwin when Charles wrote The Origin of Species. Yeah. Now, old Chucky D had many, many people who uh, came after him, you know. Uh, trying to throw hands and yeah, there's the reason that old Chucky D's ideas have stood the test of time. And it seems to be that it's because those ideas were correct. They have, they have withstood scrutiny. Further evidence has shown them to be correct, but this was a really interesting challenge here. So let's, let's go into this. Yeah. And Moonrise. <laughs> oh no, Moonrise Rabbit. That's funny. Oh goodness. Anyway, Charles yeah. wrote The Origin of Species. Darwin had proposed that structures evolve through intermediates. Yeah. So a wing would have evolved from forelimb in stages. Hmm. But some of those early stages were clearly not capable of flight. No. Myvart confronted Darwin. Ooh. He said to Darwin, how do you explain in the evolution of birds from reptiles the function of half a wing? Hmm. So to answer that question, I look to a living example. Bird chicks with small, immature wings. Yep. So there's an idea here that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And that, man, there's a lot of syllables there. But basically the idea there is that the, the life history of an individual animal, individual organism, kind of reflects the evolutionary history of that group. So like birds, baby birds like this cannot yet fly. They don't have fully developed wings for flying yet. They're still growing those. But a baby bird at that stage right there. That's almost kind of the stage that its ancestors were at when birds were first evolving wings, you know? You've got recapitulation there. There's like a, there's a retread of the same territory. If that makes sense. Like a baby bird that's developing full feathered wings, that kind of reflects the ancestry of birds when they were first developing wings in the first place. Is this making sense to anybody? I hope it is. Give me some feedback here in chat. I want to make sure that people are on board with this and that that it's making sense. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's two arms locked. Up. There you go, Vigilante. Yes. And it makes sense? Good. Good. I'm glad. Thank you, Bliss9 and Snowfall. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Excellent. Well, let's, uh, let's continue. So to yeah. answer that question, I look to... In psychoanalysis, if ontogeny recapitulates uh, phylogeny, will embryos keep getting more complex over time? Uh, kind of. I mean, in, in a lot of cases, yes. Where, like, shoot, in, in mammals, you know, an embryo might take months and months and months or years even to fully develop before it's born, you know? So it definitely is becoming more complex there. Look at us as human beings. We've got a nine-month-long gestation period. Like, yeah. People who give birth, it takes nine whole months for that to happen. I mean, holy cow. That's a long time to wait. That's a pretty advanced embryo, I guess. You know? So yeah, it is a very nine, long nine months. Definitely, Brit. See, Creatrix Brit knows firsthand. She definitely does. Yeah. 
So yeah, and shoot, you look at the gestation period of other mammals. Um, oh boy. List of mammalian gestation durations. Uh, let's get down into some whales here because they have truly crazy gestation periods. Um, yeah, a sperm whale, Physeter catodon, 480 days to 590 days. 590 days, how many months is that? Convert 590 days to the years and months. 1.61 calendar years. Nineteen month gestation period. That is almost that's almost two years for a sperm whale to develop an embryo. Uh, you know, into a, a baby sperm whale. That's pretty incredible. That's almost a whole year, says Kito Loa. If we're going by paleontology standards. Paleontologizing standards, sure, yeah. Paleontologizing subscription standards. So, yeah. Yeah. And Mayor Spaces, if two women teamed up, they could get the baby done in just four and a half months. I don't think that's how it works, Mayor Space. I've known, you know, lesbian couples, and they it doesn't take them four and a half months to just date a baby. It still, st still takes about... About nine months. Yeah. Anyway. Hmm. Vigilantis says, We're reaching a weird evolutionary stumbling block with human gestation now in that we're born pretty underdeveloped by most mammalian standards, but we can't develop a larger gestation period as the pelvis cannot accommodate birthing any later because our skulls are too big. This is true, Vigilanta. This is very true. Yeah. Yeah, there's kind of a barrier there. Where, like, human baby heads are basically at their maximum size. They can no longer fit through the pelvic aperture there after being any bigger. It's like, that that's as big as they can get. So it is an interesting, uh, that's a very interesting, you know, uh, what would you call that? Hurdle, I suppose? Although you can't clear that hurdle. It's... I suppose you could through cesarean sections, but anyway, yeah. So I guess in some sense, we might... I'm always... I'm always a little bit reticent to talk about future human evolution because... I'm a dinosaur guy. I don't study human evolution, and, like, when you start talking about human evolution and what people will be like in the future, there's a lot of... I don't know feels like gross talking about gene frequency in the future and like stuff like that i'm not going to go down that path but uh but yeah bottleneck there you go dinosaur dave that is the that is the word that i was looking for dinosaur dave thank you thank you yeah and you're a c-section baby just like Macbeth, psychanalysis very nice i wouldn't be here without modern medicine Many of us, probably the majority of us here, would not be here without modern medicine psychoanalysis. Yes, indeed. Yeah. We shall become blobs in space, says Bliss9, just like in the... Just like in that very prophetic film about the future of humanity in space. Uh, what was it called? Arthur C. Clarke, 2001, A Space... No, Wally. -E. That's what it was called. Wally. -E. That's the future of humanity right there. There you go, Mayor Space. Yes, indeed. Mayor Space on, once go again ahead. got that right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Dr. Diplodocus says I talked about the topic of how old the Earth is. My pro your professor said 2000 years? We literally have human 
structures, buildings that are older than 2,000 years, Dr. Diplodocus. What does your professor teach? I hope it's not anything related to history or geology or biology or reality, Dr. Diplodocus. What? What? Oh, shoot, like... Beer. Beer. You know, the, the drink that people drink is like 9,000 years old. History slash church stuff. Oh, boy. Anyway, I have... I'm just gonna leave that there. Mayor Space says, what, 9,000? <laughs> uh, yes. How old is our, our fermented beverages such as beer? Uh, hmm. What does the scouter say about his power level? It's over 9,000! What, 9,000? There's <laughs> no way that can be right. Anyway, yeah, there is some way that can be right. Yeah, fermented beverages like beer are probably about 9,000 years old. It's pretty nuts, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, maybe the professor was joking? I Let's hope so, Creatrix Brit, but I don't know. If they're here in these United States, <laughs> there's no telling. Shoot. Uh, I don't know. I, I'll tell you a really brief story. Story time here. Um. You know, ev everybody in their and their mother knows that the healthcare system here in the U.S. is complete. Completely bonkers. Um, and that manifests in a million different ways. Anyway, we're we're a fourth world country when it comes to healthcare here in the U.S. Um, but I, uh, when I started my job as a teacher, I got health insurance through that job. And I was really, really happy about that because I didn't have health insurance before. I was without health insurance for like years before that. So if I'd gotten sick, like, you know, that would have been curtains for me, you know? Goodbye. Uh, <laughs> uh, buried in an unmarked grave somewhere. You know, that's how it goes here in the U.S. if you don't have health insurance, basically. Um... Anyway, I was really happy to have health insurance, finally. And, uh... Yeah, so I started... Uh, I went to a doctor's appointment, the first one I'd been to in, like... Probably, like, eight or nine years. First time I'd ever been to a doctor in, like, eight or nine years. It was a few years ago. And, uh... So I'm talking to my doctor, and she seems pretty cool. You know? She's pretty young. She seems pretty hip. You know, she's talking to me about different stuff, and... She's like, oh, do you have any history of, like, health issues in my family? And I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. My brother gets stomach aches a lot. He's got some sort of a some sort of a stomach issue or something. She's like, oh, that's interesting. And she says, uh, you might buy to, you might want to be real careful about your, uh, about your stomach chakra there. You know, your abdominal chakra. And I said, like, what? Excuse me? What are you talking about? Yeah. Um. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I I don't she seemed pretty cool and then just This is somebody who's um, an MD, a medical doctor, presumably. Um Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's what healthcare is like here in the U.S. Um, I've got a different doctor now. I've met her once. 
I try to go to the doctor as infrequently as possible. It's very expensive. And, um... Yeah. Travel the World says things that make Danny go, what? Uh... Hold on to your butts. No, nope, wrong one. What? 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 Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um... So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Inachu says, healthcare, let's dog lick wound. <laughs> there you go, Inachu. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. What? 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 Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. And Mommy does. Hey, that's why I've donated to PP many, many times over the years. Whenever I've had some extra cash in my pocket. Um, they do good work over there, Mommy does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Digital Deck, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's, you know. Let's get back to some science here. <laughs> I need to watch that that taste out of my mouth and my brain let's get back to the origin of flapping flight in birds An example yeah Bird chicks with small immature wings yeah here well, let's let's go back a titch Burp, hang on uh yeah he challenged charles darwin when charles wrote the origin of species Darwin had proposed that structures evolve through intermediates. So a wing would have evolved from forelimb in stages. But some of those early stages were clearly not capable of flight. My yep. confronted Darwin. Ooh. He said to Darwin, how do hey, you Chucky explain D? in the evolution of birds from What's up with this? The function of half a wing. Yeah. So to answer that question, I look to a living example. And Gojira, you're a hundred percent correct about that. Holy cow! Yeah, chiropractors um, avoid them at all costs. Um, there are some chiropractors out there who are they're more like physical therapists, but if they're following the kind of chiropractic where chiropractic, a lot of people don't know the origins of this kind of thing. But the guy who invented chiropractic, like the founder of that field, I forget his name. He claims to have learned all of the secrets of chiropractic from ghosts because he believed that he could talk to the dead and that they they told him about how all this works with cracking spines and stuff like that. Um, yeah. It, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Do, if anybody is watching right now, do some reading about this. Just do some like Google is your friend about this kind of thing. Read about the origins of chiropractic. Um, oh boy. Yeah. Uh, there is a good Skeptoid episode about that, Lenina. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Bird chicks with small, immature wings. I wanted to make careful observations of how chicks use their wings as they learn to fly. I was keeping the birds on these shiny floor, clean lab conditions, uh. and trying to have them go up a wall that was slick to, to fly up to their siblings. Mm. As soon as a rancher came in once and said, what are these birds doing on the ground? They hate being on the ground. <laughs> give them a bale of hay. Give them something to get up on. Yeah. As soon as I got... So once again, people who were there on the ground doing cool stuff, be they, you know, native peoples living in these environments, be they ranchers working with these birds, listen to what they have to say because they have really interesting insights that can lead to cool scientific discoveries here. What are these birds doing on the ground? They hate being yeah. on the ground. Give them a bale of hay. Give them something to get up on. As soon as I got some hay. And uh, Zevins has ever heard of Senator Sylvia Allen, who stated the Earth was 6,000 years old? There's a video for her on YouTube. Is she a, a U.S. senator there, Zevin? Because, holy cow. <laughs> Stavros. 
Thank you for the five months of support, Stavaros. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for your continued support. Appreciate you, Stav. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, shoot. We here in the U.S. also had... What was his name? Mike Brown? Um, yeah... Uh, here was a, he's a representative, a U.S. representative from the state of Georgia, and, uh, he had something to say about the biological sciences, including evolution. What did he say? God's word is true. I've come to understand that. All that stuff I was taught about evolution and embryology and Big Bang Theory, all that is lies straight from the pit of hell. And it's lies to try to keep me and all the folks who are taught that. Oh, boy. From understanding that they need a savior. Uh, it's really itch am amusing that he mentioned embryology as well. Embryology. <laughs> it's usually when it's folks like this talking about stuff that go, oh, yeah, evolution, Darwin. That's li it's all lies, you know? But to mention embryology in particular is, oh boy, yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, which is really funny because here he is surrounded by all of these dead male deer, all these servants here, who are a testament to evolution right there. There's all this individual variation here, which is the, that's like, that's grist for the mill of natural selection right there. This is the raw material that natural selection works with. Not all of these individuals are going to look the same because their genes vary a little bit. An individual variation, the uniqueness between individual critters is what allows natural selection to work. You know? It's what this is all about. But, I don't know. Somebody with hate in his heart like that, he's not gonna... He doesn't want to understand that kind of thing. You know? And you can't talk to him about that kind of thing because his mind's already made up. He's not... He's not gonna be receptive to new information. He's not there to actually learn things. He's there to talk. So anyway, yeah. Um, that being said, let's get back to our origins of bird flight here. Here, let's uh, let's continue. What are these birds doing on the ground? They hate being on the ground. Hmm. Give them a bale of hay. Give them something to get up on. These are quails here, I believe. I got some hay or partridges. For the chicks. We made partridges. An interesting observation. The partridge family. I came back one day, and my son, who had been helping me, I asked him, how are they doing? How was the data today? And he says, it was horrible. I say, why? He says, they were cheating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this so much. This is another wonderful, wonderful example of how science works sometimes. Science. Just like our our researchers earlier, our graduate students who were like catching birds in those nets, and then you know, like their hand, they had cuts on their hands, and they would go like that, you know, to like get rid of the blood, and then they realized that oh shoot, these birds are poisonous. Here's another beautiful example of science taking place like that in a way that you would not expect it, you know. Oh, this makes me so, makes me so happy. This is this is wonderful stuff here. Uh, let's go back a little bit. Yeah. I asked him, how are they doing? How was the data today? And he says, it was horrible. I say, why? He says, they were cheating. And that moment, a watershed moment in my life. I, what do you mean they were cheating? They ran straight up vertically. I said, that's impossible. 
but it wasn't impossible. To better understand this behavior, Holy cow. My son, Terry and I decided to carefully <laughs> measure how young birds use their legs and wings together to travel up ramps of different angles. Yeah. Here's our little experimental animal here. And we're my friend Julia Clark, an expert on the evolutionary origin of birds, yeah. joined us on our experiments. This is so cool. So I think a lot of people, a lot of people, their their picture of science is like, I don't know, people in white coats in a laboratory with beakers and test tubes, you know, pouring them back and forth like this. And so much of science is actually more like this, though. It's like seeing something really weird go happening and going, wait, what? H how did that happen? I'm sorry. What? <laughs> that might be one of the... That might really be the sound of scientific discovery right there, the, what you just heard. Just... <laughs> what? <laughs> that's it. Um, that's how scientific discoveries are made. T take a look. Take a look. The first angle is not steep. It's wild. Right. This is not a... Not a trained animal. This is not a trained animal. That was easy. Just walked. No yeah. Nonchalant. Yep. No way. Yeah. Necessary. Next, we try a sharper angle. And, uh, yeah. Look, Origin TG says, look at those fancy hay bales used to prop up that tree trunk. I mean, yeah, look at this extraordinarily sophisticated, expensive scientific equipment. We have a hay bale right here. We've got what appears to be a ratchet strap or a... That might be some sort of other tied down. It doesn't look like it's a ratcheting one. Anyway, uh, that would probably run you as much as, holy cow, upwards of $6 at O'Reilly Auto Parts. That tie down strap right there. I mean, what scientific lab would have that kind of budget? Holy cow. I can understand why this research was never done before. And there's a, you know... Uh, a big piece of wood, you know, a tree limb that was cleaved off. So, yeah. Yeah. Next, we try a sharper angle. Okay. And those are chuckars. You are exactly right, Origin TT. Holy cow. I'm sorry. You're correct about that. These are chuckars, which I think are from India. Yeah. These are, I think they're related to quails. Let's look them up on our Tree of Life. Yeah. Chuckar. Chuckar. There you go. Yeah. Thank goodness they are least concern, uh, conservation-wise. But they are... Oh, they're related to ptarmigans and partridges and quails. And peafowl, too. Cool. Anyway. Oh, wrong video. Ah. Oh, to heck with that guy. Um... Yeah, let's uh, let's continue. Okay, so this is much steeper than before. It is. Let's see what happens. There we go. You're not sure what you see. Exactly. And s some of you were wondering, is that Tree of Life available online? It absolutely is. There's the link right there. Take a look at it there in chat. And can you eat them? Are they poisonous too? I would not try and eat either of these researchers. Um, I don't really eat meat though. Hex row, you know? Um, I doubt either of them are poisonous, but paleontologists and, you know, other, you know, biologists like this, um, they, they probably don't even taste very good. I don't know. Um, but you know, I'm not the guy to ask. I'm, I'm not a meat guy. So yeah. No way necessary. Yeah. Next, we try a sharper angle. Ooh. Okay. So this is much steeper than before. It is. Let's see what happens. There we go. You're not sure what you see exactly. because it's so fast. And yeah. Birds ain't slow. 
beautiful it actually mm -hmm. is. Check this out, high-speed camera. This time, the bird used its wings as it ran. And every time it they should have the, the chariots of fire music playing right here as these birds flap their way as they're running up this, uh, this tree stump, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, there we go. Will this work? Hmm. Here we are. I got you covered. Don't worry about it. Yeah. There's a cover right here, Lenina. There we go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Wing assisted incline running. Oh yeah. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> and we will make that an alert, Lenina. Yes, excellent. Hopefully I remember to do that. But that's that's great stuff. Yeah. To lift it up and take it like a bird flying straight up to this, mm -hmm. this refuge. It was using its wings to pull it forward onto this log and yeah really steep ascent that is going to be a challenge right so this is now nearly vertical this is vertical standing yeah. tall vertical like any tree let's see what the animal can watch do. this but but it's still using oh. its legs still using its, it's legs it's climbing on its legs using its wings to yeah the tree but not to fly it up this yeah Pretty cool. Very cool. This has turned out to be not just representative of the bird we looked at, but every flight capable bird that we've looked at in the 15 years since. Dozens Very cool. Dozens of birds. I have also observed the same behavior in the wild. And I have even seen young birds use their wings to assist their hind limbs to paddle across a body of water. Very cool. So, Ken, how did this change the way we think about how dinosaurs get in the air? Mm. Well, we now know that there are a lot of dinosaurs, little feathered theropods, that have little wings. And, and the explanation... And Wombat Holst is no angle measurement in this science? There, uh, there's 100% some angle measurement going on here. You should check out Ken Dial's papers about this. The explanation for their existence yeah. is, is really difficult to resolve. And I think that... A reasonable explanation is That's to look more at than what young range. birds Holy with cow. similar wings can do today. Birds show us the possibility of what these dinosaurs could have done. Very cool. Scientists have long debated two main possibilities for how flight evolved. Mm. Dinosaurs could have used their clawed hands to climb up trees and then glide down with this gliding behavior eventually evolving into flight. Huh. Or dinosaurs could have run faster and faster on the ground, flapping their wings, and some species then evolved the ability to fly. Yeah, so this is called the trees down hypothesis or the ground up hypothesis. 
but our research suggests a third possibility. Yeah. So every bird that we've looked at, dozens of different species, do this behavior. They exhibit this behavior of flap and running. No Very gliding. cool. They don't jump off of a bale of hay and glide down, and they don't fly up. They flap run up, and they flap down. Huh. Juvenile theropods might have used their forelimbs similarly. In the adults, the legs alone were probably sufficient to escape predators or to hunt down prey. Uh, ontogeny. The growing theropods, small wings uh. provided an advantage. Just imagine the selective pressure at the time of theropod ontogeny. dinosaurs. Yeah, Everything ontogeny. Everything trying to eat everybody, chasing everybody. If you could have moved up to an elevated <laughs> refuge with the use of these little wings, you would have lived to see tomorrow. Yeah. Those young theropods would have run up to escape predators and then flap back down when it was safe. Hmm. Over time, small wings evolved into larger ones. Yep. And this is what we see in the fossil record. We're able to take to the air. Very cool. Awesome stuff. Holy cow. And there's a peregrine falcon right there. Holy moly. We just did a dinosaur deep dive on this critter not too long ago. But yeah. Really, really cool stuff. Holy moly. Uh, if you would like to watch the rest of this video, or if you'd like to watch that video again, if you want to bookmark it or whatever, there's the link. We just watched the whole thing. Good stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I have been streaming for almost four hours at this point, but I'm doing fine. I will have to go use the little paleontologist room in, uh, probably less than an hour here. But, but, that time is not yet now. So, yeah. And Dr. Diplodocus, I'll see you around. Thank you for being here. Yeah. And how many birds have claws at the end of their wings? Not very many today, Inachu. But there is one bird that does. And that bird is called the Watson. Take a look at that bird here. This is Archaeopteryx. Anyway. Yeah. Like the Watson. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Look at, the, look at those claws. Look at the claws. Yep. Mm hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah, very nice. Disaster. Hmm. Best get out of the water. Invaluable. Yes, indeed. So the adults do not have claws on their wings. Those claws go away through ontogeny. As the chicks develop into adults, they lose those claws, which is really interesting. Yep. Yep. Ooh, we'll talk about that another time. But yeah, isn't that cool? On top. Yeah. And uh, why are belly buttons not erased through ontogeny, says Canada DNA? I, ooh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I bet you they are in other animals, in other mammals who have an umbilical cord, other placental mammals. Yeah, here. Let's do it. Let's do a. 
Google is our friend here, you know? Um, let's see. Let's see. Let me Google that for you. Here we go. Um, do other mammals have belly buttons? There's a link right there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on, hang on. Copy URL. Okay. Do other mammals have belly buttons? Google search. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mental fl I don't know how reliable a source this is. Sounds a little squirrely. But, uh, yeah, mammals are born with umbilical cords. When they emerge, the mother chews off the cord with her teeth, leaving a flat scar that is less noticeable than a human's navel. Often these are harder to see and obscured by hair. I don't know. My mom did not chew off my umbilical cord because I still have a belly button. And it's an innie, not an outie. Chimpanzees and gorillas have one similar to a human in shape, but they do not go in or out. Interesting. Huh. But platypus and marsupials do not have belly buttons because they're not placental mammals. That makes a lot of sense. Platypus lay eggs, so there's no umbilical cord. Marsupials' umbilical cords usually fall off within their mother's pouch, and a scar never forms. That makes sense. So a belly button, a navel, is basically a scar. You know? Yeah, yeah. So not all mammals, but all placental mammals, Murph. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. And Inachu, do you know what the best dinosaur game is, by the way, Inachu? We'll play it one of these days. It's been a long time, but, um... Yeah... Take a look at Saurian. Saurian is an open world video game intent on providing the most captivating prehistoric experience yet developed. Yeah. The life of a dinosaur from hatchling to adult, surviving in their natural habitat. Saurian is unique for being rooted in rigorous scientific Ooh, literature. Yes! Direct collaboration between developers, prominent paleontologists, and other experts ensures Saurian's dinosaurs look, move, and behave as close to the actual animals as current science allows. Yep. Saurian's gameplay is based on managing your stamina, thirst, and hunger without falling victim to the environment or becoming another animal's meal. Yep. Players will need to draw upon a variety of skills and abilities to survive. Master Dakota Raptors grapple and pounce to subdue combative prey. Avoid the sharp eyes and bone-crushing jaws of Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> and track both predator and prey with keen senses. Brandish your natural defenses as Pachycephalosaurus and Triceratops to ward off aggressors and fight for mates. Survive long enough to court and reproduce and pass on your genes to the next generation. Good stuff. Change dramatically as they age. As you grow what do we call this? You'll need to utilize new skills. I'm sorry, what do we call that chat when dinosaurs change dramatically as they age? Ontogeny. Ontogeny. Thank you, Lenina. Ontogeny, yes indeed. Um Ontogeny. Yes indeed. <laughs> this is from the Saurian game, by the way. Wonderful game. Ontogeny. Yeah, um, good stuff. Good stuff. As you grow from hatchling to adult, you'll need to skills and strategies. Not Lamarckian evolution. There you go, Necromancy. Yes. From the bottom to the top yeah. food chain. Other creatures. Necromancy knows what's up. Predators may see a hatchling Tyrannosaurus as easy prey, but they'll think twice before going near an adult. 
the ecosystem is just as complex as the dinosaurs. Yeah, they did such a good job in this game. The tallest tree to the smallest leaf has the same amount of scientific rigor based entirely on the available fossil record. They made like an incredible effort here to actually get the plants right in the latest Cretaceous Hell Creek formation. This is the same formation that I've done a ton of field work in. I've dug up almost all of the dinosaurs that you just saw. And uh, the plants here are based on the real fossil evidence from this formation. Just an incredible effort to make this as authentic as possible. They did a tremendous job here. Even the weather yeah. replicates what is known of the Hell Creek Formation. Yeah. This is the closest you can get to living the life of a dinosaur. There you go. Dinosaurian has been the passion project of over a dozen developers for more than three years. Very, very cool. The team has worked unpaid in their free time to reach this point. Yep. Fueled by a shared respect for dinosaurs and the desire to convey a modern scientific understanding of them to a wide audience. Very cool stuff. And untapped medium. Now, Saurian needs your help to be brought to life. Yeah. Survive Hell Creek. There's the T-Rex there. Very cool stuff. And this has since become a reality. This was a Kickstarter project. It's now a game. You can get on Steam. And, uh... You can play it. I've played it multiple times here on stream before. Well, we might even do that again sometime this week. We'll have to see. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Mommy Does has played this apparently. Says my Triceratops partner Otis was a terrible parent. Well, his name was Otis. What do you expect? He let a T-Rex eat all three kids. Oh, no. Oh, Otis. I'm sorry that happened to you, Mommy Does. But yeah, yeah, check it out, Inachi. It's really good. Um, excellent. Excellent game there. It, it is still in, like, double pre-alpha stage or whatever the video game people call it. So it's still in its very early stages, but holy cow, is it worth it. If you want, like, an, an accurate portrayal of a Hell Creek environment there... You will find no uh, no better video game than Saurian. It is really, really good. I think you'll like it a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. And is Dinosaur Fossil Hunter good? Dinosaur Fossil Hunter can be a lot of fun, Dr. Diplodocus. It's a different kind of game. It maybe doesn't strive for accuracy as much as it's, like, kind of wish fulfillment for, for being a dinosaur paleontologist and digging up dinosaur fossils. But I would also recommend it. If you if you like games like that, you know, kind of, you know, calming, you know, games in which you, like, you perform tasks and then you, like, slowly rise through the ranks, you'll like Dinosaur Fossil Hunter, Jody Fish. Or Jody Fish, sorry, Dr. Diplodocus. Yeah. Jody Fish likes it. And thank you, Jump Jess, for the five months of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Jess. Welcome back. It's great to have you here. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. An early access is what it's called. Haha, <laughs> says Dinosaur Dave. I, th I thought it was like Mega Pre Beta Alpha or something. Am I wrong? I I'm very likely wrong about this but yeah and jody fish this is high praise jody fish says if you have a really stressful day dinosaur fossil hunter can be especially cathartic and relaxing it's good feedback jody fish thank you yeah. um but yeah yeah Oh boy, it's after six o'clock already. I've been streaming for over four hours now. You know what? We might actually save our fossil news for tomorrow because I don't know if we have enough time to really cover this and and do that with appropriate seriousness and attention. I've got some other stuff I gotta work on tonight, including shoot, our uh Baby 
Triceratops skeleton. I've got to work on this a bit more tonight. Wah! Assembling this, which is going to take a good while, and assembling, maybe, if I have time for it, our Iguanodon hand. It is probably about time for me to wrap up tonight's broadcast. And we can cover our fossil news tomorrow and some other paleontological topics. So yeah. Without further ado, let's go ahead and start wrapping up here. There's an Archaeopteryx to run underneath our credits there. Thank you to everybody whose names show up in the credits. Really appreciate you. Let's see who else is live on Twitch right now. We'll see if we can raid in to another science streamer, perhaps. Who else is doing some science live on stream? Um, let's see here. Uh, you know what? It's been a long time since we've talked to the Harry Horror Show. He's talking about Jack the Ripper right now, not Jack Horner. Jack the Ripper. Why don't we go say hello to the Harry Horror Show? Um, because it's been a long time. This, I think, is intended for mature audiences. Uh... There we go. Yeah. But we'll go right into Harry and see what he's up to. Anyway, thank you everybody for another wonderful stream. I hope you had a lot of fun tonight. I know I did. Thank you for your support, for your questions, for your enthusiasm, for your inquisitiveness. Thank you, lurkers and chatters and raiders and question askers. Thank you, chatters. Thank you, moderators. For doing your moderating. I appreciate you more than you know, moderators. Lenina, Claire Burr, Mayor Space. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. We're going to go say hello to the Harry Horror Show. Talking about Jack the Ripper. Oof. Grim topic. And he's got what looks to be a dog or a wolf skull there on the desk. Maybe we'll ask him about that. But... Let's go right in to see what he's up to. Thank you, thank you, everybody. And I'll see you next time. Tomorrow, around 2 p.m. California time, another paleontology stream. Don't miss it. But for now, bye-bye. Thanks again.